Good morning to everybody watching on YouTube who uh, can't... Uh, can't Best show yours. ever. Um, we've loads coming up, but we do a bit of a... Here's what's coming up on the show um, to let people know what we're uh, doing over the course of the morning, between now and 10 o'clock. So have Johnny and Cullum. We're going to be joining the studio in a little bit by Vinny Perth when we'll have all of our functions fully up and running, Cullum. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Why not? Finney Parts is going to be here. There's a lot of interesting developments in Europe last night. Big homecoming for the Derry team after their own heroics uh, the Conference League. So um, we'll talk to Finney a little bit about that. A couple of games tonight as well. And I know Johnny was watching that Derry game, so we'll get his thoughts on that in just a little bit. We want to talk, um, obviously, about the uh, rugby this weekend. It's back front and centre. Is there a bit of a sense that this will be the last game where Andy Farrell tinkers with that 15? Uh, we'll have James Tracy in studio uh, in a bit to discuss that. It's the weekend of the All-Ireland Camogie Finals and Noel Connors will be here uh, to get into uh, primarily and uh, probably only Waterford against Cork in the All-Ireland uh, Senior Final and uh, way up Waterford's chances. The Cullen Bowie uh, Derby, they're calling it. That's right. It's a big one. Yeah. A lot of nerves there in the household. Like first fight is there, yeah. 1945, and they've never actually won it. Do you know, so a bit of nerves. They're all down in Waterford now, gathering, right? Pairing, and <coughs> will come up? It's a bit, a bit of a buzz down there. It's true, the uh, fingers. Yeah, there is actually. Yeah, what they love there. You see, Waterford people like they're mad about their hurling. Very sad about the last few years. Mm. The football can't get off the ground. Like, sure, mm. like the, you know, you see in the power rankings, they're thirty third. Like, yeah. And the uh, camogie is kind of the the good news story because they're regularly competing, but now they're actually got to the showdown. So when you talk to people from there, yeah, they're very excited about it. All they want, when you talk to people they, from all there, they want is for the, those all unaware, they want is the trophy. <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> Colm lives with somebody from there, uh, his wife. All they want is a silverware. They moved That's into like, a new house this week, Johnny. They, they moved. Where did you move to? Whitehall. Traumatic. Oh, that brings like me Dan, back. Dan was telling me all about the memories of it. Traumatic experience. Yeah, like like it's stress, like it is stressful. But you know the the thing First about it. problem. Well, that's one thing. And then the second thing is, it was the first time in years that it was the only thing we were both focusing on. So that was the oh, only yeah. thing we were after the, about we the wedding for was four, the last for one. four days. Yeah. So not even then we were juggling, but four days in a row. It was like a festival of moving. Like and it, all we were doing was just doing it, that. Was it enjoyable? At times it was, yeah. You got to pepper in some kind of enjoyable elements to it. Mm. The best part for me was renting a go van or go cargo, oh, as yeah. it technically was. God, I love that. Mm. Driving the van yeah. up high. You felt like a like a workman for. It was great. <laughs> 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 it was amazing. And then also you have to get it back to the depot on time. What was it like a transit if, or something? If you're a minute late, you get charged. Oh, that wasn't so that a bit like really odd at the end. The good fellas like look. At, I was that looking around. Be, you're, you'd be eking every. You'd be waiting outside until they like. Wheel it in I with got 15 it, seconds to go. Four, 52 <laughs> seconds to spare, I think, the, the last A one. transit, was it? It was, uh, yeah. And um, it was just amazing. Like, that was the best part of it. But then you get you get very into it, but then at one point, I think it was Sunday there, we were like, just after the all Ireland, I watched that. Took two hours out to watch that. Afterwards, I was like, looking around the house and like, we're not going to get this done in time. Yeah. Because we had to be gone on Monday. We had like gone, gone on Monday. How much stuff did you, do you have? It's amazing. It's unbelievable. Did it take the amount days to of shift nonsense stuff? you accumulate. I know, over but the years. like. Yeah, because we had to clean out our rented place from top to bottom made sure it was clean to get the deposit back mm. and then shift everything over to Whitehall the problem was that it was at least a half an hour drive every time four days seems like a lot Johnny for it does. it doesn't it a lot of memories no it was um, I wouldn't have we have three kids and I'm I don't think we'd have enough to fill four days I'm not saying we did absolutely everything the, the unpacking obviously everything in the four days like building, building the beds everything in the new place switching some matches so picking have up a table you didn't have the van for four days no, I had it for like three hour increments throughout the days because oh, okay, it was a cost of fortune. Yeah. So we had to go to Wicklow to get uh, a couch. Nice. Free. Yeah. And then he threw in a coffee table. Lovely fella. Oh, good man. So that was handy. He threw in a coffee he table did. as if you had like bought something. And, from then, uh, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then we bought Part a, of the deal. We bought a table and chairs off this lovely one from Sally Noggin. And they retail at like a thousand and we got it for 350. Yeah. You know? You've lost interest, have you? How was no, the, I was um, just checking the sound issues. We're good now. How was the how was the buying the house thing in the first place? Did the whole thing, a long time. Yeah, it did yeah, it did. Like we went to sale agreed last year, and that very that, stressful. That Johnny was no good. And then from start, I was like the bidding war is unbelievable. It, it actually doesn't feel real, you know, when you're bidding yeah. against other people, and then eventually you get I mean, the call. It's at accepted. times, at times and it might not be accepted. That's, how do you know? It's uh, sale agreed, but that then that actually doesn't mean anything. I I have to say I was involved in this 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 whole thing in terms of selling a gaff um, for modest money now it must be said uh, just throw it out there but what was this last year and um, 
a geezer there was a, there was a war a bidding war between two people uh. and it was it was funny you get like every time there was a bid I got a text right mm. so it was like coming in and I don't get texts anymore like it's it's a 99.999% like yeah. WhatsApp the odd text I don't even have the notifications on but I did for this it was like so it's gone up a grand a grand a grand a grand a grand and this has gone on and it, the deadline was say like 12 but it went to like half one or two o'clock and your man messes me and he's like there was there were two people bidding one of them is I don't think he's even seen the house he's in Hong Kong or something mm. but the other lad had seen the house and that was grand so uh, two months later he just pulled out yeah. After asking me to make changes to the house and to do to, to I spent I say I spent three or four grand doing little and three or four grand was a lot for a cheap house. Making changes and then he just bailed. He just bailed just like that and he, he got all his money back and I was two months down the track. The market was contracted. So some lad had agreed to buy your house. Yeah, he's gone sale agreed. He the asked you had, to make a lot of changes. Yeah, and did then, you not tell him to he was like, well, you know, because in fairness, like you, you, you buy you, you you enter an agreement, but then it's like, well, there are a couple of issues there and I, I was like he just bailed and I was like if somebody had come in with 20 grand more for the house which was 20% more than it sold for by the way if they had come in with 20 grand more a week later there's no way I would have sold it because I've entered an agreement yeah. with you here but that meant nothing like and he just two months later he just pulled out he said oh I think the market's uh, the market's kind of gone, gone a bit against me here I was like well this is two months where I've, you, I, I, I've done wasted nothing here but you wasted my time and I had no recourse and then the house is eventually sold for like what 12-14% less a month or two later but at that stage I was like maybe three months later I was like what Why? What does the seller have as a right here nothing like mm. I, I, t- I just felt the whole process was totally unfair best of luck to him anyway <laughs> uh, Fergus Kjol says Jesus now I can hear them I wish I couldn't we don't care about the minute of Cullum's move to be fair I was mm. going to ask you right, about it, like I was asked to like relax yeah. what part of White Oaks huh? what part of White Oaks I've Leary uh, I've Vera Road L- I've Leary oh Road. I used to live on Ivera Road. Near DC God, there, anyway. yeah. There's a, there's a betting shop in uh, Boylesworth, uh, Boylesworth, I shouldn't mention, but there's a betting shop that's still there and it was a tiny shop and they expanded during my college days, but I, I had no interest in racing as, at all. Like, yeah. But I just went, I was so bored in college, we think we had 10 hours a week, went into the betting shop one day and that's how I got into racing. Wow. Yeah, look at me now. Um, we were discussing a little bit earlier on when people couldn't hear us about the experience of All-Ireland Final Day and I was saying it was down there in Crow Park and there's been a lot of conversation about the atmosphere at Crow Park and mm. the vibe around it and what mm. should or shouldn't happen. And I, for me, I would leave the match day experience at Crow Park as is it's absolutely fine I don't need to be in there four hours before mm. throw in we were in there about 45 minutes or so we were able to get the burger and chips take our seats sit down enjoy it a little bit the weather was obviously crap and that does impact on it particularly we were like three two two rows back you're uh, you're just in the danger zone there of when it rains you are getting wet so it's a little bit like but look mm. by and large I think there's a perfectly fine job going on I wouldn't think about that too much um, but I just felt like going in and around Crow Park before the game wouldn't it be a great opportunity looking at the homecoming last night to shut down Crow Park on an all- on All-Ireland final day at least half of it bring in food stalls like game simulators drink stalls uh, you'd have a pile of like former players milling around you like little bits of build up here and there you could have like an audience building there fan zone type thing mm. uh, tailgating type thing um, you could have that going on from like what the games at half three you could have that going on from 10, 11 o'clock in the morning as it builds up to the game and really like I mean even if you forgot about the right cultural reasons to try and use a admittedly grubby main thoroughfare in the city uh, for the right reasons culturally like even you'd make money out of it mm. it's, and it's not it's not to do with the GA it's a Dublin City thing um, but I, I really would urge them to have a look at something like that because I think that of all the days the proximity of Crow Park mm. let's do it it's a good shout like because there's so many articles written in the Irish Times alone about the state of Dublin City Centre and how grimy it is and particularly O'Connell Street that should be your champs say like if you look at it it's amazingly wide should be beautiful. beautiful street if you look at it objectively but then you walk through it and the vibe is completely contrasting to what you see yeah. it's just unsettling like you walk by and you're just on edge the whole time and nine times out of ten absolutely nothing happens but you just have a sense that anything could kick off at any point and also even besides that yeah it's just a bit dirty. This this idea, by the way, wouldn't solve that. But it, no, no, it wouldn't solve it. But, it would, but like nothing is working at the moment, and the dash suggestion, there's, that helps two things. First of all, a talk since Sunday has been like the lack of entertainment around the All Ireland final that mm. they relied solely on the game itself, which is fine. But there's no big day out or no Super Bowl equivalent. And then the second thing is yeah. that's one proactive, positive solution to the problem of O'Connell Street. So it kind of works in both ways. I'd love to see it happen. You could make it like a kind of a food festival thing as well, like where they, the, you're, if you're going to the match, 
um, like if you're going to Game and Croker, your your options are really sh- crap food, like basically burgers yeah. or whatever chips, like along the way in these like foul swelling kind of vans, um, spewing out crap or whatever, and make make it a festival and make it make it a thing. It's not a bad call, like because mm. O'Connell Street is it is quite sad to see where what it has become. Like it's I, you've, you've really no reason to be there, and you don't really want to be there much of the time. The only collective community thing you can do going in on Ireland final day is to go for a pint. Mm. That's brutal. Mm. Do you know? Yeah. Brutal. And I know there are people out there who don't want, uh, famously don't want eight-year-old kids going to uh, All-Ireland Final Day or the semi-finals. Tickets should be reserved for other people, I think was the point that was made a few years ago, mm. which I couldn't uh, disagree with in any more sort of vociferous terms. But um, I'd like an alternative mm. of something to do. And I think that that would be a good one. And, and as I said, Wine like, or shots or... Not, yeah, no yeah, points, yeah. So. wine and cheese. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I, I, I went that. from I remember going from uh, when Galway played our mail last year we, 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 we went from a, a Gaelic games match to a wine tasting afterwards nice. it just happened to be the same day all sent from Condorip which was probably a first ever the uh, dichotomy of Johnny Ward right there in a mm. nutshell yeah nice wine and a, and, a, and, a, and a good game of football I wonder um, yeah like the two examples so far so it would have worked really well for the all Ireland final with Dublin in it and then the homecoming last night with the football team yeah and the captain of Dub and like a big Dublin presence in the team so it worked there but I wonder if you're getting two non-Dublin teams involved would you still attract be a different. It, it would be a different thing right but like I think you'd have enough businesses commercial support um, it, it would be a smaller scale thing right no question about it mm-hmm. like as in when Dublin are playing the All-Ireland Final it's um, it's how do, I, how do I word this that's the correct way like it's not the same it doesn't. It doesn't capture the city clearly, in the same way that when Dublin are playing. So yeah. you're going to have that knocking. That's just the way it is. Can you have but beers on the street then, or is that allowed? Oh yeah, I think that's. Yeah. I think part of shutting it down. You would. Mm. You, Dublin City would be. Would be saying, "Hey, Dublin City, can we serve pints here?" Yeah, sure. That sounds. That sounds like. An, mm. Do you know what I mean? Like if you, if you're shutting it down as a um, thing, but it shouldn't. Like I'm saying, I don't think it should be only about having pints. It should be. Whatever it is, food. So I was at the yeah. Monaco, had the, had the um, pleasure of being at the Monaco Grand Prix early in the year, and they clearly have to shut the city down to facilitate the thing. Um, but they have loads of stuff going on, like they have mm. little Formula One simulators. They had like this thing where you could go in. Um, myself, and my wife went on and took on two random people at how quickly we could change a tire. So they have all that sort of stuff going on. There's no reason you couldn't have similar things mm. wrapped around this. It'd make loads of money. Local business would be delighted with you. Mm. More people on their bikes, Johnny, because the Traffic will be to be a minor um, effect on traffic, obviously in the area. Yeah, over the course of the day, which I think would be we could live with that. It's funny as well. The the bars in or around O'Connell Street, it's questionable what business they do generally. Um, like, do you ever go yeah. for a pint in in no. sin, like I, I would think like Sackville Lounge or somewhere like that that I I'd go to. But other than that, like uh, Shifty Dad makes a suggestion here. The one thing that could and should change is it being on a bank holiday weekend. Good, good shout actually put the All-Ireland final on yeah weekend. I think that's what Shifty Dad means here anyway but yeah because then I suppose I you are creating an idea of a festival and maybe, people yeah. have more time and they can definitely stay up but yeah you could definitely make more of an event out of it because it's such a huge deal but it does feel like um, it only gets going like from a TV event anyway from about 3 o'clock on yeah. a Sunday and she, you're getting about your day beforehand and it's just like oh yeah the finals and I might watch that especially for if you have no trip, yeah. yeah especially if you have no skin yeah. in the game but it, so it could be a good thing as for the homecoming last night look I saw we have a video there of um, Vera Pau and her staff being presented on stage and the the crowd cheering them and, and Pau celebrates fairly wildly enough like dancing around the place and mm-hmm. the, I da- saw, the dance of somebody who's leaving with a dance of relief, yeah, that she might it might be all over for her and then she can walk That's away. Or, or the dance of uh, a job well done in her part as well. She might think that. Definitely felt like she was she was going full bore by way of... I think she was... It, it was like, like a defiant I, dance. I think, I think if, if she was staying on, you wouldn't be going that... You wouldn't do that dance, like, because, I mean, there was no real reason to dance. Like, Ireland had, what, seven shots on target in three games or something. I mean, it wasn't like, you. I wouldn't, as a manager, I wouldn't be, like, very, very proud of of Ireland's, you know, um, offering over three games. And I wouldn't be dancing in front of the fans because this is, like, it's a little bit of a gimmick, this thing as well. I think that there's so much support for this team, um, you know, especially among, like, young aspiring girls who want to play for Ireland. I think this is massive for them. And, and the results are a little bit incidental. And, like, it was a great crowd to turn out, but I think she wouldn't have done that. 
I think she knows that this the end is probably nigh. And uh, it was interesting to see the body language of the players behind her. I think there was it's it's interesting to look at their faces as as Vera was enjoying herself mm. because it was mixed to say the least. Yeah, here she is on the screen now for people who can't see. So the, all the coaching staff are being applauded and they're reciprocating. And then Pau stands out a mile for dancing in the corner. But I was, I was like, first of all, fair play because mm. this is all supposed to be escapism anyway. This is the whole point mm. of it. So first of all, fair play. And then secondly, I'd love to know what's going through her mind at the moment because this whole fallout after Nigeria game with Katie McCabe like I imagine that type of thing happens all the time where you're, the captain turns to the manager and said get so and so off and bring that person no on and then that. the manager's just like shut up but it seemed to be prolonged yeah but the problem is that it went to the press conference afterwards yeah. now that was very pointed and maybe she knows well that she's gone because why would you say that about your captain well, why would you make she, an example of her if you're going to stay she on she has been very frank it's one of the things we discussed even during the tournament that maybe she just at times can what we would perceive and maybe she doesn't at all overstep the line in terms of her commitment around what she could say you know like we talked about the defensive thing and the yeah. well they're a little bit they're great players but they're a little bit slow did not really need to say that but she's seriously direct anyway totally but I don't remember her going to that length mm. where she's saying Katie McCabe is not the manager Katie McCabe let herself down here though yeah like, and you, you have to you have you don't do it like in such an obvious way if you have one of a word with the manager you don't you're not the manager like and yeah. I I honestly think Katie McCabe completely let herself down there. That's not her job. Like I remember, if you do it, do it in a subtle way. It's the culmination of a few years of frustration. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's she probably again. It's probably coming to the end. Yeah, I remember one example of uh, Fernando Torres in his peak at Liverpool getting taken off away to Birmingham City when Rafa Benitez was in charge, and Torres is walking off, and you can see Steven Gerrard in the foreground, and he's shaking his head at Benitez, like, "What are you doing taking Torres off? He's our best player." That was the end of it. Uh, this this thing with this these type of things happen all the time, but there's clearly such a massive tension between the pair, which we alluded to. Remember the uh, pre-tournament press conference in Dublin just before they flew out, and you could call it a night for the tension between the two of them, like mm. sitting the distance between myself and Johnny here, and it just felt there was. Uh, a palpable sense of unease between the two of them and McCabe actually acknowledged that too that sometimes they they argue a lot and this has gone to the other side now where McCabe's gone through the three games she was like basically what was all what was the point in all of this like we didn't give it a go there's um, mm. nothing more classy in sport than a manager who's been riled up by clearly riled up by a player refusing to take debate there's nothing more classy than the press conference afterwards where they go Katie McCabe is a class act. What a player she's been for Ireland. Yeah. How could how, you know you couldn't you know that sort of you can you can choose your words. Mm. That's um and it feels that, like that's maybe. probably not her style though. In fairness, like you said already yourself, like I don't think she can hold back. Like those one of the, the probably the best things about Alex Ferguson's management was his ability to refrain from uh, calling his players out in public mm. most of the time, mm. most of the time. Mm. But often he left it behind closed doors and then completely let himself down when he released his book right after retiring. And in that press conference, literally did a chapter on each player that caused him a problem and just called out all the players. I, the more you know what I mean? the passage of time with Ferguson, to be honest with you, I, I was like this guy's ruthless. Like. Well, and also brutal and totally out of kilter with obviously what we think uh, the best practice around modern day leadership or management is. Yeah. I mean, I know that obviously we're talking about somebody who was at their heyday a lot of years ago now, but... Um, why isn't yeah. Vera Powell loved then by the squad in general? Like, what is it? Why isn't she getting a... Uh, Pat Dolan writes to about it today. It is a bit strange. Like, what's the elephant in the room here? Like, Well, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. And obviously the FAI... She's done a good are, job. Are, do, do you think, let's put it another way, her dancing last night when she came out, would you say the dance is justified based on the performance throughout the World Cup? As I said, I think the dance wouldn't happen if she was staying on. And like, look, I don't want to get too far down the road of somebody having a bit of a jig on the stage after, like, it's the homecoming is absolutely legitimate. The turnout is legitimate. Yeah. It's right that we acknowledge what's happened here regardless of whether we've progressed or not like the the tournament in the round has been a raging success analysing whether Vera Powell should have done a 10 second yeah, jig is probably see, doing it a bit of a disservice exactly I think um, there's a lot of distraction around it but if you look at it against the Olympic champions they're one nil up against one of the better sides in the world Australia they lost by a penalty uh, and against Nigeria they drew nil all uh, and this Nigeria side's good like they beat Australia and it's first ever World Cup and the teams come on leaps and bounds. Like, it was a few years ago, that team was struggling. Mm. So, in many ways, Vera Powell has improved 
the team massively but I suppose th- yeah. then the next question is well we're not getting the best out of our two attacker attacking players because Denise O'Sullivan didn't have a great tournament by her own yeah. standards we're going to talk about Derry City and that but it was just so weird watching an Irish team in Europe scoring three goals because the Shamrock Rovers have scored one in their last six now I think and we do have a problem across Irish football generally where we're just not very good at scoring goals at the moment and uh, the women's team is a bit like that so watching Derry was like this shouldn't happen you've scored three goals in totally, a game yeah. I'd be careful what you wish for by the way as well because I'd look at last night at the um, odds on who the next manager would be third in the list oh I heard this go on, yeah Phil Neville that's right yeah Phil, just, Phil, just be, Phil just just fourth in the list Colin Bell I'd be go just back, yeah. I, I hang on a whole fire there caller is who's what I said to you Tom Elms who's involved at the minute yeah, and was, Eileen Gleeson who's involved before that so yeah. like two good options for sure and a bit of continuity there but I just think beyond that we want to be careful one thing that we want to touch on and Vinnie Parts is sitting outside and he's, um, he's he's itching to get into this conversation and to tell us to shut up so he can get his air time but one thing that I did want to touch on <laughs> was a tweet that I put out last night that took the internet by, by storm <laughs> That is a tweet. Um, I put it. Yeah, <laughs> what, what a quote! Th- thanks for uh, thanks for explaining. On, as as Jerry would say, thank you for explaining the joke. Um, I put up a tweet last night because I'd seen a clip of David Clifford doing what I felt what uh, caught me by surprise a little bit at the time as a uh, an outstanding bit of skill. It was a little sort of uh, right hand to I think was it left toe uh, solo, and it was the the fact that the yeah right hand to left foot and the f- hand right on top of the foot do you know what I mean like normally you see you're dropping the ball from a couple of feet onto your foot and you're trying to get that bit of a spin on it and mm. you're sort of keep motion but it's felt like um, there's a uniquely Kerry style of football that I'd say Galway actually to be fair probably as close to it as it mm. comes in terms of the other counties around the country but it just struck me as a remarkable little bit of skill I did feel I'd put it up and you get one or two little nibbles and that'd be about it Johnny but no as I said it has taken the internet by storm and uh, that's a joke by the way um, <laughs> it's been a lot of interesting reaction to it um, Paddy Willis saying Tomas O'Shea was a legend at it and uh, Shawnee Thornton jumping off the back of that saying left hand down to the right boot going full whack down the line poetry in motion uh, Spillane used to do it at full tilt said Eric Phelan um, and then uh, <laughs> and then there was like a lot of other reaction uh, D- 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 <laughs> Dylan Gaynor saying Clifford has invented a solo now <laughs> FFS <laughs> which is not of course what has been said uh, Dermot uh, says oh yes let's talk about it FFS as if it mattered um, that's actually a foul says Fred Mallon and there was a fair bit of that uh, Joel Sullivan does his hand actually leave the ball if hand is in full contact with the ball at all times is it technically a solo or a foul mm. I mean lads come on now but uh it did. It, Go on, sorry. Oh, I just got us thinking about that little bit yeah. of underappreciated skill in yeah. sport. That's kind of what that really did. Mm. Yeah. I, I was thinking of a few examples there where you were yeah. going through that, but I don't know if it's so much a skill, but um, long foot passing in Gaelic football, I think, oh, is underrated. Yeah. Paul like, Galvin style, sort of. Galvin style. Uh, Jim O'Connolly as well, being able Paul to pick Conroy's out, being able to tick out a pl- uh, player with their foot, and it's very yeah. direct passing. And also, it's mm. the type of pass where it actually helps the momentum of the recipient. Mm. Um, I and even I see Conor McManus saying yesterday, you know, he yeah. likes the mark and, like. Yeah, yeah, likes the know, mark, the, hates the, foot, the, the condensing. still beautiful, like. Um, and also in soccer terms too a skill I always appreciated which was never able to master myself in games was um, the ability when you're receiving a pass on its way to you to look behind your scanning, corners, scanning. Now, I, I, I always uh, struggled with doing that and it's an f- unbelievable skill because it buys you so much time yeah. and the class of 92 talk about it how um, the, the, it was drilled into them like if they mm. didn't look Skulls would have been a big scanner, a big one they? Yeah, if, they, if they didn't look before they received the pass blow up in training yeah. and you'd be given right. an earful yeah because it's like it's no good receiving the ball with facing your own goal because you don't know what's behind you so uh-huh. you can't progress as a midfielder I like how your uh, criticism of your own performance is not actually football related it was like you know, if I could just have been a bit of a better scanner a bit of a better scanner oh yeah it's life, it. it's life made skills it. you know it's life skills but uh, <laughs> there's a load of um, load of little su- like subtle skills now that I love but that tweet I had, to, I had to watch that a few times to appreciate it. Tell you one thing, you'll be yeah. You should, now. you should watch it. You should like that's 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 the whole point. Like it's it's middle, one middle, of middle. no, they will be scanning the lovely rooms in your new house in Whitehall. <laughs> You've moved. It's one of those little things that that uh, nobody really that's talks about, days. and by and large, you don't want to spend your entire life talking about uh, solo and football. But it's just a little thing mm. of beauty that I feel culturally. No, I like that. It's kind yeah. of unique to carry a little bit of Galway seeping in, and I'm having it. What's an underrated skill in hurling? Oh, there's no there, the one thing that is that is that there's no underrated skill in hurling because like you know well if anyone can suggest something genius. sorry James Boyle here says Henderson uh, never shouts a clap during a match to make a sub 
Klopp would rip into pieces. I remember Henderson being taken off at Old Trafford and laid into Klopp. Mm-hmm. That's and, a bit different though, isn't it? Yeah, but I mean, it's the same thing where you're still chatting back to your manager, why'd you take me off? <laughs> it's the same thing. Like, yeah. It happens all the time. It isn't a big deal. Yeah. It's the fallout really is kind of why this whole thing has fallen apart. I remember um, a, a player who shall remain nameless telling me one time that he was playing under Stephen Kenny and he pointed out, he, he shouted over to Kenny and he's like, will you take such and such off? He's doing nothing, right? In the middle of the game. Mm. And Kenny's way of dealing with it was, he called said player into the dressing room on the Monday and he goes, um, I just watched the game back there. You didn't do much yourself. <laughs> Quite like that. And that was it. Yeah, that is good. And that was, that that, was it. That's that was the end of defeat. matter. And yeah. one of the members involved now is actually now a manager and probably huh. learned from that experience. Well, I think there's, yeah, look, I don't know. Somebody has pointed out three Dr. Phil's analysing the dance. So Sam McGowan, now there's a little bit of that about obviously our, our yeah. thoughts about what Katie, Katie McCabe is doing as well. But I do think that is Katie McKay brought into the room at the FAI analysing the what what did they call it the full and yeah honest, full and comprehensive comprehensive review, review. like everything. if if she's not it's pretty clear what her feelings are now mm. and there was probably a little bit of that going on as well yeah yeah it's interesting uh, I'll be interested to hear Vinny's thoughts oh yeah I, know, no, I knew chat. you were getting there all yeah. right yeah yeah, yeah. park it <laughs> park it <laughs> and move reaction. on that's, that's uh, Cullum's uh, Cullum's way of park it and move on right Thanks a million for coming in thanks it's for having pleasure me. as always the, yeah. the, the, you make it so easy the pressure of the week hasn't shown on you an iota it's a first world issue. I mean, no, not that. It's, it's, it's not. moving house. Absolutely, it's, absolutely, yeah. it's a good thing. Like four minutes past eight. Uh, off the ball, by the way, coming to the Cork Podcast Festival. You can join us on Sunday, the twenty seventh of August, at the Cork Opera House. Special guest on the night, Jimmy Barry Murphy. More guests to be announced very soon. Don't miss out on a great night of conversation and crack in the heart of the Rebel County. You can head along to Cork Podcast Festival and uh, search for Off the Ball uh, for more details on that and to pick up your tickets. Go on. No, I was just chatting with Tanya. All right. <laughs> yeah, you, you enjoy yourself there, lads. Like. Back of the room there. Uh, Vinnie Parts standing by. Before all that, John Giles on Kenny McCabe. Uh, I don't think it's the right thing to do, uh, Will, to be honest. Uh, you know, the, 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 the manager or the coach, wherever it might be, is in charge. Uh, and, and I must say, from my experience, uh, I think as soon as the coach takes over, which he did four years ago, from day one or from the start, she's the boss. And players can't make suggestions, uh, especially uh, the captain can't make suggestions as to who is to be subbed. I don't think that's on because the, the, the coach herself is watching the match and she's been able to see uh, who needs to be subbed or not. And I think what happened in this situation, uh, I, I think Katie McCabe, who is a very, very good player and captain, uh, suggested that uh, one of her, or Sinead Farrelly, should be subbed. Well, you know, the coach is watching the match and she should be able to make that decision. And also, I think the coach slipped up uh, by saying, well, as far as I was concerned, uh, Farrelly was, was the fittest player on the pitch. She shouldn't have to answer that. In other words, from the day she, she takes over the job with the players that she has, she establishes that she's the boss and she will make all the decisions that have to be made. So that, that's four years ago. OTB AM The F1 Pod on Off The Ball with Chicago Town Pizza Formula 1 Yeah, we go to town on it Then you see the gap at the end of the race and you realise actually the gap is still pretty massive to Red Bull It is a problem and I think a bigger problem for a newbie is that how long term the rules are locked in for how long the we're ready to the rules we're talking about regulations in 2026 that's the new engine regs coming that's already two more full seasons away the F1 pod on off the ball OTB AM the sports breakfast show from off the ball seven minutes past eight you are welcome back I'm Vinnie Perth welcome to the studio good morning to you morning how are we doing did you ever have a player on the pitch give it the big one and uh Mm, sort of try to force your hand about having to make a substitution or a decision or no I don't think so not that I remember or experienced it you know players every so often lose the head or say something but I think yeah, and I don't remember anything as definite as, as what we seen do today how would you um, deal with it like because Vera Powell this is not an easy situation to be in 
No, I think I think to be fair and, and where I wasn't helpful is uh, um, look um, I don't want to slag off a full nation but Dutch people can be very blunt and they, they have a way of saying stuff I was trying to explain this to someone the other day I worked, I worked not that long ago for a company that was half owned by a Dutch company and when they leave the room they don't say can you turn off the light like an Irish person or they sort of it's, I, I put it down to the way they've learned English they say turn off the light you know it's very blunt and it's just, I think mm. it's how they've learned the language to be fair so um Maybe maybe you get the impression that Vera Pro isn't Vera Pro isn't a real warm coach. You get that impression. So that doesn't suit every player. But I think and I, I don't like this saying football people, but I think a lot of football people seen through what happened the other day as not good enough, not acceptable and not something that you'd like to be part of as a as a coach or even as a teammate. So I didn't think it, it looked good at all and for for Katie McKay, but thought it was really poor and um totally I wouldn't great. like to be I wouldn't like to be in that situation. I think I think for someone who is who is a superstar and whatever, I think she let herself down to in that in that instance, and I think look, she's got credit in the bank. She's been brilliant for Ireland, but I don't think that was good. Do you ever have a player come to you in any of your guises, like during the week, to say, "Here, listen, what was going on there was not right. We should do it differently." Yeah, but that, that's, that's okay. Grand, like. Yeah, people question you, and like no one has the right answers, and and sometimes you know you might end up <laughs> you know in a heat discussion with a player, but I think all the good coaches reflect as well, and they mightn't they mightn't say to the player, "Oh, you were right what you said," but you reflect you'll have a discussion with your staff, and you know that's that's fine, same in sport is same in business you don't always um you don't always agree to everything but at the same time nothing wrong with different opinions nothing wrong. like mm-hmm. players as well see stuff and they hear stuff and um but ultimately only one person or the staff are making the decision and they're the ones that are judged by it and I think I think going into the tournament uh, it's funny how my brain works going into the tournament I probably wasn't a big uh, Vera Pau fan um, because of the style of play to be honest with you it doesn't excite me too much but I've probably come away from it being a bit more of a fan because it's a bit like it's a bit like the Joe Smith era like you know, all people have done for the last couple of years is sort of not all they've done, but there's been a little bit of criticism of Joe Smith. Revisionism. Yeah. What a legend that man was and what he'd done for Irish rugby should never be forgot. But it's very easy now to kick people as they walk out the door and I like, get in that sense with, with Vera Pell and I just don't like it and I think it's okay, probably part of modern society, but that team getting there I mean, she she spearheaded that group, and I think that should not be forgotten. Like you know, mm. let's see how the next few weeks play out. Um, Derry City through to the latest round. We start there. There's a few games to touch on. Uh, latest round of the Europa Conference qualification: three three in Finland last night. So they go through five four in aggregate, and uh, a major break in the next round with Tobol of Kazakhstan and the third qualifying round next week. Um, serious battle here. Had to come from behind twice. Yeah, I think I think what uh, I was chatting briefly to Rory last night um, he was literally sitting on the plane waiting to take off so it was nothing more than a brief chat just delighted for him personally I think it's been a really difficult time uh, for him personally I mean his family have gone through so much and uh, he's, he's he's had to deal with that and you still have to manage a team in the spotlight and while we, we sit here and we, we talk about teams and they should be close to the Rovers all that stuff you have to forget there's a human side or you do forget there's a human side to these people so that would have been um, it's very hard to explain what the feeling of winning in Europe is. It's just different. Um, it is your players. Your players obviously love it and all of that stuff. But you're you're operating at a, such a high level. The teams these these people are playing against. Um, and that sense for Rory last night would have been huge for him. But you've got to say he's had huge experience in around it. Done the dark set up mm. in terms of uh, getting prepared for Europe. He's he's done that role for uh, Stephen Kenny and he, um, in terms of an opposition analyst for us and then he became an assistant manager and, and now he's managed himself so he's a huge experience but also the experience on the pitch and the bravery and I, the first text I sent him was hey they score four don't worry about it. we score five yeah. and we've always had that type of joke going around and talking around the staff where how do you win games you've got to be brave and go for it and I think it's a lesson for some other teams you know in, in my view so uh, it doesn't surprise me you look at the winning goal came from Michael Duffy I think it was his 36 European game um, 
That's huge, That's mad. That's huge. At that level, that experience, incredible. Do you know as well, Vinny, like, they, Derry lost Patrick McLenny in the first half. They then lost Cameron Dumbigan. Like, possibly two of their most important three players, really, right? And I was just thinking, like, his recruitment has been really good. Like, so you could bring on O'Reilly and Diallo. And sort of, I, I'm not. I'm not trying to diss Shamrock Rovers here. Shamrock Rovers squad hasn't been good enough at all in Europe this year. Whereas, in fairness to Derry, they've. I don't know what the the, the contrast in terms of resources and wages is, but Derry have been able to showcase. Like Kavanagh scoring the goal last night, he was another kind of a bit part player who scored the first goal, and their their peripheral players have had a massive role in this. And I, I was just, I was really, really delighted for, as you say, for Rory. But I think he's he's signed very well, even. The, the guy that got in from Scotland McMullen as well yeah. you know excellent for the first goal and he just seems to have a good eye for a player which I guess you saw when you were with him as well yeah he does he's always had that that's that's his, his sort of it's not I don't, I don't I don't like saying it's his biggest strength because then you're, you're trying to undervalue say his management style all that stuff but he's got a great strength of having an eye for a player and um, absolutely but I, th- I think the key for me in terms of and I've sort of alluded already was look okay I know he lost Patrick in that Look at the starting lineup. It was attack minded. Mm. They didn't go out and try and hold something. Ben Doherty, a fullback, is is essentially a winger, and he's playing him a fullback. You've patching McElhenney, Duffy, and Kavanagh in your team. Like it's so attack minded, where it's going away from the sort of let's sit back and maybe There's all that no stuff. No park in the bus whatsoever at any point. And and you listen, you can get done. I mean, I remember we we were attack minded out in Larnack and lost four 0 I think, or maybe even more. In the heat, um, yeah. We went chasing a game against Calgary, um, a game we should have won, a European game. And we got done. You end up three 0 and you look like you look like a clown. Um, uh, so it can go for you and against. That doesn't you. feel like what happened to Rovers, is it? Like no, no, it was different. It was different, and that's where maybe that's a lesson and. Far be it for me to preach to, to, to people like Stephen Bradley who's done an unbelievable job. Essentially, they should go on to win four leagues in a row. What an amazing achievement. But that attack-minded, that bravery, and it's like it's like I say about the train only passes, when, when it comes to, say, Europe, only passes once a season. And if you don't jump on it and you don't ride that wave, it's gone for another year and it might never come back again for players and that's what we always had had that message and I was disappointed for Dundalk on out I thought they had actually in many ways the best chance and you get that sense even the older Dundalk players that are still around that team um, they've done quite well to get to where they were but this was it was a 50-50 game I felt that You've got to seize the moment. I think that's what some people and I think Rory's really good at that. From, from again, it's done dark experience. Some of the dark players and I think Rovers will that will that should really hurt them. I think they've missed a huge opportunity there. And the the champions of Ireland should, unless it's a bit of bad luck in the playoff, should get group stages. And I've been saying for a long time we're getting closer to a second team in the group stage. And you look at Derry they've got obviously a huge game against side from Kazakhstan but we should be getting at least one team particularly the champions because UEFA have protected the champions mm. so winning your first round means you have a playoff or mm. group stages it's it's that's going to hurt them and particularly and I, with the conference league as well it's well, it's paid, a, isn't it for Irish well, teams to well, progress well to be fair UEFA and, um, and I get a lot of criticism they've protected the champions so the champions route is protected and that's where just winning the first game and Rovers went into that seceded side and losing that is it's it's not good enough uh, from a European perspective we I have get, to have some I think as well we have to have some re- reflection on that two Icelandic teams fairly comfortably be two Irish teams in the end and like where are we going if Iceland with all due respect to Iceland but the population is still ahead of us in terms of this sort Summer and we need to look at facilities and that, and we need to look at our development of the game. I think anyway, like the Rovers against an Icelandic team that were third in Iceland were were, were inferior. They really were inferior over the two legs. Which isn't to say that Icelandic domestic football is better than Irish domestic football. Well, as of this summer, it's it's um, the two teams were definitely they they got through anyway, and Breidablik were better than Shamrock Rovers. They actually were. Um, yeah, they were, and they were they went out. To Copenhagen, I think this week, and they were fairly well beaten as well. I think. Look, you can have you can have bad moments. I think I think Europe came at a wrong time for Rovers. They've lost their form, a uh, couple of key injuries. Yeah, mm. so I don't think it's helped. I've always said I'd love to see this Rovers team with a bit more pace. And and the thing about winning games in Europe at the highest level and going into group stages is you might only get one or two opportunities, and sometimes it's. The hardest thing for Irish clubs in Europe, once you go up the next level, is it's like 
you feel like you're in most games but it's just one little moment where you switch off for a quick second or you're a little bit tired and some player a right winger comes out of nowhere and just gets in behind you wins the game and that's where Rovers probably need a little bit more spark I would say in the forward area I've been saying that all season I don't think they're clinical enough is the word I use I don't know what that's that's the right even domestically um, they score more goals than everyone else this year but domestically they could do with adding a little bit more we flair. were having a bit of chat just as he was coming on because I think Vinny predicts Rovers win the league by 10 points which he wouldn't be alone no they're still 4 points ahead but at the moment they're 100% they're inferior to Derry City they're probably inferior to Pats right now this Rovers form is, is, is a slump it's a real one goal in 7 but now they can concentrate wholly on the league will Jack Byrne be back soon when will Ferruja be back um, mm. but the title race is 100% on because this Sharma Rovers team you've nothing to fear for them at the moment you really don't you touched on something just a bit earlier Vinny that I wanted to pick up on because Dan was talking about on the show yesterday morning about the how Derry from a style point of view are set up much better to progress in Europe than a Rovers let's say or most other Irish teams in terms of the formation the wide players the little bit of ambition they show uh this might be a very naive question but if that is the case and given the pots of money that are available in Europe and given some of the things that you've mentioned in terms of at times Shamrock Rovers maybe approach to Europe even when they you mentioned the train analogy even when they've had the ticket for the train at times they've sort of not shown the ambition to go and, and eke something out of it um, but if those pots of gold are available why aren't more of the top teams in the league setting up uh, in a way like Derry to progress in Europe and avail of that money yeah I, I think we've got to be careful like Johnny made the point there that Derry are, are better than or you've got to be careful snapshot in time over a season yeah, okay yeah. Derry have Derry aren't ready to win a league title yet I feel part of that is down to a lot of the injuries they've had obviously and I think it will take time for that that squad to be built from where they're coming from I think Rory's on the right path to do that right so I, I still think Rovers are in a really strong position of power and that's why they've got to now fix their squad If, if but ultimately that's for them to see I presume the staff can see what the problem is so well, this is a big debate that we've had in around the Irish international team is a perfect example of it the, um, and, and around Sean McRovers it's about styles it doesn't you, I always compare and I've done it many times and this is a good time to bring it back up I compare the Dundalk team that I was, I was it with for 8-9 years to Liverpool and their style of play not, not direct re- replica but Dane Massey uh, getting forward cross and over hit cross Sean Gallon scores a back post mm. Trent and um, uh, Robinson okay good example where this Rovers team are very much like say a Man City not easy not necessarily that they're not easy on the eye but it's it's build up build up pass 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 and that's okay and that, that is good enough and you've got the players to win the league the problem is when you go to Europe playing that way or you're Ireland going to Europe uh, playing with a back three it's a little bit slow it's a little bit like you're waiting on something to switch off and when you go up levels people don't switch off as much so that that's the best way I can explain the sort of two different systems I'm a believer in as I said about Rory I'm a believer in go and score I remember uh, one of my first games in charge and, and John Gill was with me and it was the first time with the group and he said we were we were one nil up with two minutes to go. Oh, keep one to send a half back. And went, no, we'll get to second. Mm. Right now it was a corner, and he was right. And that's the all. And it, and I remember he. I'm saying it to me only recently. He learned a huge amount of that attacking play. And by the way, I learned that off Stephen Kenny. But say no, get the second. We'll win the game and instead of that sort of. I'm not saying Rovers have a defensive mindset. I'm saying attacking play for me and bravery is something that's getting lost in the game a little bit all through the levels it's gone a little bit too slow a little bit too passive even domestically in our league some of the games are great it's brilliant to watch but you look at say a team like Bowles I'd rather watch a team like Bowles all day long than some other teams you look at Sligo toward last second last being struggling but they're probably making more passes outside of Shamrock Rovers than anyone else yeah. so our game has gone passive a little bit I think across the world and I think the teams that play with speed and power in my view you've you've a better chance as much as Man City are there I'd love I'd love 20 of the best players in the world and play Man City's way and do what Pep does but if you're not going to have 20 of the best players in the world I believe 
the better way is go out and score more than the opposition. And, and in fairness to Derry, like because the, the Vinny alludes to this in the first leg, McGonigal started, but they had Brandon Kavanagh, Patching, McElhenney, Duffy, McGonigal, like a really attacking team. Brian Maher has done really poorly for one of the goals. They've coughed up three goals. Higgins will not be happy with that, and they've still managed to find a way by playing effectively attacking football. And they, they, they if you watched that game yesterday, it was playing in Finland, but it was really, really 50 50 type game that was swinging either way. And I, I like their composure as well, Vinny. For you know, Rory's not on the job that long, but like the, that experience, like Duffy to get that goal. Um, for, you know, I, I think that they, they, they never gave the impression that they didn't believe they could do it. No, and, no. and their and, and th- their squad depth got them through this. Shamrock Rovers definitely failed them this year, they were just let down and they had no pace for key games, goalkeeping issues. Um, so Stephen Bradley has a lot to reflect on at the moment, but ironically, now or not. Uh, uh, and Alanis Morris said irony maybe Shamrock Rovers now can just focus on the league Derry could be playing four more games in Europe they have a very good chance 50-50 maybe chance of getting through the next round yeah. well look they were take. The, the problem you have is and just just to so to briefly go over like particularly the good thing for Derry is and, and in terms of even compared to say the results and the style of play to bring people on the journey so yeah. the Irish, Irish ladies team have brought a certain amount of people on the journey I feel that a attack minded coach would actually bring more now okay and that doesn't mean I think Vera Powell should lose a job I'm just saying you've got to take people on the journey okay and I think that result yesterday will the, the amount of people around Derry now that will stand up and their attendance is a huge anyway but they really that will capture the man, imagination okay but the other side of it is they're playing a team from Kazakhstan so the easiest thing to, for the general public Kazakhstan sure you know you, they're probably the first thought of Kazakhstan is probably Borat you know? is, yeah. so but they've knocked out uh, FC made- Basel so it's yeah. not like the people are just it's like there's a side in the Faroe Islands now just qualified for a group stage world football European football is changing. The champions of Hungary, champions of um, Romania, all these sides are just now, every every nation is doing what we're doing. UEFA have improved, improved the coach education of teams and world football is improving uh, underneath the elite level where everyone is sort of grouped in around the same way. So yeah. it's really difficult to, to progress in Europe. At the same time, it's... Uh I'm sure if you, when you were talking to Rory last night, uh, you'd rather be playing them than Basel. Uh, they're mid table, aren't they, in Kazakhstan? Yeah, the, the only challenge with going back to, to, to Kazakhstan is it's going to be a huge flight. Like yeah. It's going to be really, really difficult. And once you get to certain rounds, your wife will expect you to charter a flight um, mm. and not expect you. That's part of the rules within. I don't think it's for the. And maybe the next round. Uh, so the expense is, is huge and different things. There is a certain allowance for if you travel over a certain time. So it starts getting really expensive and it will affect their league position. And um, there's no doubt about it because you're traveling for hours. So in many ways, Basel is easier because it's it's a, a couple of hour fly. You'll know all about them. So it's harder to do your homework. But modern scouting now, they'll be okay. What about the. Um just say the Ireland job, right? The Vera Post have come back to it. If you, if just say Vinnie Park, if there was an interview to that job and you went in, and you, what, what would you, how would you approach it in the sense of this is women's football, right? Is there a difference in your head if you applied for a job, a different job, say in the League of Ireland or even an international job at underage level? Is there a difference in your head of how I approach myself in this interview here? Does that make sense? Because it's, it's slightly different. Yeah, I've only really done one interview since I've came out of football as mm. much as. I got interviewed here a couple of weeks ago for the Cork job with the lads, <laughs> uh, and I never. I thought you were going to say Liam I never, I never applied for the job, so I've only ever done done one interview uh, since I've come out of football. Um, I suppose, look, it's difficult to answer that, but um, I, look, w- the women's football. I like, for example, I wouldn't apply for that job because I've no, exp- like, I couldn't do. It's, it's. I'm not saying it's a different game, but it's slightly. You need a certain skill set to coach in the women's game, and you've got to understand it. So, but I think I think you've got to sell yourself and the dream. And like I'm a tact minded coach, so if I went to meet someone, I'd be I'd be playing on the point of. You know, the odd time we might lose a game, we might lose two nil, three nil. I might get done the odd time, but I, I, I'm a dreamer, and I think I think there's nothing wrong with that in terms of. I think any Irish side should be thinking about group stage European football. Now there is a mindset go, oh, just win the league every year. That's grand. I don't believe in that. 
I think you should be aiming for group stage football. Um, that's if, why if I made it. win the league then this year, is that a successful season for them? Well, well, it is, and it is, and I think I think within that club, I think that's really good, and and continue to build and build and build. You're allowed, you're allowed an off year. Remember, like, you know, people look back with rose tinted glasses of airtime at Dundalk, but in seven day in Cork, hammered us mm, out of the park. Mm. But people f- sort of forget that, and we got beaten in that year four or five nil in Europe. So look, you've got to set, you've got to dream, you've got to believe, and in 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 sort of. I would, I would probably, I would probably only go back to a club. I think that I felt could would want to play European football. Right. Does Stephen Bradley prioritise the League of Ireland over Europe? I would say, I would say, no. Uh, it probably doesn't look that way because of how when you got to the group stage last year, you probably felt you need to secure the league again. I understand that mindset. Um, I work for a club who people thought people thought our American owners just wanted the money of Europe they didn't they've that much money it wasn't about that but they wanted to push the club as a European club and they felt that was more important than domestically mm. because you could fix the domestic stuff a lot easier where I get the sense where I always feel just qualify for Europe and we'll fix it next year or by winning the league the Champions route and we'll fix it next year so no I'd say uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of the right word here I'd say his own not his own ego because that's the I'd say he wants to be and his players want to be successful in Europe it's he's, a, he's a football and coach as well Bradley like, and I know from speaking to him down the years like he felt two years ago in general he felt Rovers hadn't achieved in Europe last year when they got to the group stages he made in hindsight a pragmatic call our squad depth is such here that we need to win the league and realistically in Europe we'll do extremely well to get out of the group so we'll we'll prioritise the league that was fine but this year was a rep, was a retrograde step because they, they had no young players coming through basically playing in Europe uh, of any kind consequence their squad was was either too old or too slow um, to compensate for players that couldn't play like Farouja and Clark and they they took a major step backwards they scored one goal in Europe this season that was a VAR given penalty Um, and as much as French Varos are very like you don't expect them to beat French Varos they shouldn't be in this situation so they've got a situation where they've taken a step back and now they are in a battle in the league they really are in a battle in the league Uh, it'll it'll be interesting to see how they respond but I think the four in a row is obviously something um, you know to motivate them now but this is a, this is a challenging time this is the most challenging time for Bradzer as a coach since um, Gavin Bazuna came in into goal because Rovers once Gavin Bazuna went into goal Rovers had serious goalkeeping issues right Gavin Bazuna came in and then Rovers progressed and then started winning leagues They've, this is the first time since really that he's been under proper um, I suppose internal scrutiny over where the squad has, has gone because they're, they're not playing well at all at the moment like Vinny was at the game last night so I can't talk about that but the the, the the kind of life has gone out of them a little bit at the moment and they can't score either yeah it's 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 a challenge for him but what I will say is there has to be enough credit in the bank to give him time to do that oh, he's, 100%, done a, yeah. he's done a remarkable job uh, for, for a young coach and he's in a really strong position and um like all the all the greats, whether it's League of Ireland times, Kenny, whether it's Fenlon, whether it's going over to the UK, whether it's Wenger or Ferguson, have all had down years where mm. things and you've had to rebuild and set a squad up. It's just about it's just about what what they see internally, uh, Stephen and his staff to say. Do they see the same problems? Do they think it's just down to injuries of say Jack Bourne and Ferrugia? And, mm. and we're going to find out. But it's fascinating. There's only like. League of Ireland is, is so competitive now I think the top four is only five points between them at the moment so we have a title race I still stick by ten points because now coming out of Europe means um, but we're in a mad situation where someone like Pats were that poor in form that the co- coach lost, lost their job if they win tonight against Sligo they're only a point behind Shamrock mm-hmm. Rovers it's bizarre Um you're able to lose a lot of games in this league at the moment and still progress. So it's really exciting times. Um, as I said, it's great that one of the clubs is, is is bashing away in Europe. Now that the GEA heads have gone away for a while, we can grab some of the headlines and say, hey, we're here. Well, very briefly as well, I, like as much as I want Irish teams to win in Europe, Rovers getting another three million or whatever it is this year it wouldn't necessarily be great for the overall balance of power in the league. So Rovers losing out on that money and Derry making money and Derry and Pat 
Pats being quite close to Rovers in the league at the moment is probably better for the overall picture we don't want Rovers running away with it every year yeah. and Bowes hanging in there as well obviously yeah. uh, uh, with Drada tonight uh, just a quick word on Dundalk before we leave you Vinny obviously it, um, too much to do last night uh, we mentioned their their opponents they were 3-1 down going in 2-2 on the night and that's it they're out uh, Daryl Horgan was the thing I wanted to ask you about paraded before the the uh, crowd last night really warm reception for him and I wondered about what sort of version of coming home to Dork we're saying as well he's from Galway <laughs> no. he's literally ah, he from is Galway he's home. from Galway he's from, he's from a Galway, Galway family coming home he's Th- got a Dundalk 30 year old Darrell Horgan coming back having done a bit of a trip around what sort of a version are they getting back oh look um, who knows but I tell you what like first of all his wife's from Dundalk his kids would would always do the summer camps in Dundalk and different things like that so he is coming home <laughs> despite what the Galway man says uh, I thought there was an outside chance if Galway had been in the Premier Division you wonder whether the Comer brothers might have went after Rory Galway. Gaffney Patrick Hoover oh. bring them home but look um, uh, again I spoke to, I spoke to Daryl yesterday and uh, I said you know, you know what? Like, I tell you what they're getting. They're getting it's. They're getting that Cluxton type character back into the dressing right. room. Okay. Um, Daryl used to keep me out for hours back. Back when you know the strength and conditioning coach didn't worry about people's loads. And he, because he, he played off the left, I'd stand at the corner of the box. He'd roll the ball into me and bend on top corner. And like, I mean, he would, if it was snowing, he wouldn't stop until he, and then when he put one in top corner, he'd go, yeah, yeah, I want to do it twice. You know, it's just him. He's just a perfectionist. That's the family as well, I think, Vinny. Yeah. yeah they're a brilliant yeah. family. Like. And, yeah. and I think we've got, Duffy is, his, Duffy is one of my favourite players, right, ever to coach. Daryl Horgan's one of my favourite players. Uh both same position both have that same thing we've got some real stars in the league people will be excited to see I hope I hope Horgs goes back because he's played in different positions and he's signed for clubs who play different shapes goes back and plays in that left wing position and tell you what when Derry played on dock you're looking at two absolute legends of left wingers and if you um, haven't seen the Duffy goal yesterday have a look at it like that the quality of the header and you're right behind it with the video and it's like for Michael Duffy who's had lots of injuries I thought that was just a beautiful moment and him and Horgan proper talents so We've got we've got another another star back in the league, someone who compete with Forrester, Tell, uh, Jack Bourne, Michael Duffy, Patrick McElhenney, and, and the more than we get, him, yeah, mm. yeah. And as I said, he's that Cluxton type figure who's going to come in and and set the standards in training. And O'Donnell will be absolutely buzzing another Galway man to have uh, Daryl back in there. So exciting times for Dundalk. They're probably a little bit short from from a squad squad point of view, but signing Daryl will will certainly help them. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. Vinny, thanks a million for coming in. Thank you. Fair play, as always. Uh, loads still to come. We'll talk to uh, James Tracy in just a little bit about the Ireland Italy game this weekend and what it means for the um, team that are tested, I suppose that's the way to put it, for uh, for that. Maeve de Barca was down at the Ireland homecoming last night, so we'll extend out our conversation around uh, the Republic of Ireland women's national team uh, with Maeve as well in just a little bit. Loads of comments coming into us on all kinds of manners of things, so do keep those coming in. It's uh, 8.35, it's Friday morning, you're watching OTB AM, the sports breakfast show from Off the Ball, and uh, as I said, loads still to come. But right now it is time to uh, turn our attention to the Camogie final this weekend. We did the Cork preview yesterday with Sarah Donovan on the line, so to give us the Waterford side of things, delighted to say we're joined now by Noel Connors. Morning, Noel. How's it going, gents? How are you? How are you keeping? Pretty good, G. How are the nerves? Uh, yeah, I think quite optimistic. Um, it's been a long time since Waterford Camogie were in the All Ireland, so it's uh, something to certainly look forward to. What is it, 78 years? So it's something something that we're probably not used to but something that we're definitely looking forward to We chatted a good bit on the show last week about the buzz ahead of the fun, uh, the football final and uh, the jury was kind of out as to how engaged both counties were uh, in the lead in at least what's the buzz been like down there? It's been amazing to be fair um, I suppose our, our hurlers and our footballers haven't done particularly well over the last kind of 12 months so everyone has really rode in behind the Camogie team they've been fantastic over the last number of years not just to say it's this year but over the last number of years and uh, showing their support I suppose uh, a fair reflection that was in the semi-final now I know it was only in Nolan Park up the road but I think everybody that was at the match mentioned the Waterford fans and how engaged they were and how they didn't stop chanting so uh, I think that's probably a reflection of where Waterford's support is in terms of the Camogie team what can it do as well if you look at like the Mead ladies footballers in terms of uh, being a bit starved on the men's side what can it do for the, whole, the not the brand like but what can it do for Watford Hurling generally to get people um, 
I suppose so emotionally involved again like I, I the, the last I think the last time I saw you playing was in 2017 in the final unbelievable passion that day like um, what can it do I suppose to the county generally Noel <laughs> It is a in twenty seventeen that that's kind of like an early dig at is it? Uh, oh, wow. never, it's like, <laughs> to the chest. No, but, it, was, uh, it was a, it was an absolute compliment actually. You were one uh, of my favourite uh, hurlers, if not sportsmen yeah. ever. You know, that's what I was telling Ali Canning at the race the other day. Actually, telling you. <laughs> well, to be fair, I, I do think like in fairness, Waterford as a, as a county by and large is is, is very much rolling behind everything that's GA. Mm. We're very fortunate in many ways that we're, we're on the sea as well and there's plenty of other sports golf and basketball etc are very prominent here in rugby um, but GA is without doubt number one so I do think that if, if you see success then it breeds success so not just necessarily if the if the girls are going well it has it certainly has an impact on on the lads as well and I think that's really really important um, as you mentioned there you see the, the significance of a mead ladies footballers and what that's done to the county so I do think that good showing and even like a lot of the a lot of the say the lads were at it like Boston Brick were at the match in Nolan Park as mm. well last week so that kind of is a uh, kind of testament to what has been done as well at underage structures in award for Camogie it is inspirational as well, isn't it? Like, if you look like... I, I can really, really um, attest to the, the young girls who want to play soccer now, like, uh, in Ireland. And, like, for a young girl who may or may not want to play camogie, like, if she sees this game, um, you know, Noel, on, on, on Sunday, it's like, this could change her life. Absolutely. And, like, we've been very fortunate that we have the likes of Bell Carton that has probably been a star when we haven't been doing, haven't done particularly well over the last number of years. And it's amazing to see someone like her that has been so ingrained in in Waterford GA, not just within the Camogie side, but also within the men's side. Like I remember being up at the the the, the conference every January when I was young and I was doing research and I see young Beck Carton walking in with her father and obviously our father is heavily involved in the GA here I think he's the, the manager for Munster and, and trying to promote games in Munster Hurling but I remember seeing her at a very young age and just being in awe of someone that was so young but like so willing I suppose to spend time in Crow Park when you're probably surrounded by the vast majority were males that were probably in their, their mid to late 60s so that kind of gives you a snapshot of what what she's all about so it's it's been amazing to see the likes of herself um, being really the person that a lot of GA people in Waterford look up to not just females but males because she's been so talented but also so committed and it shows that if you're committed what it can actually bring I don't believe that the um, optics are ever enough with these things to I don't fully subscribe subscribe to your theory I think that like the fallout of London 2012 there was supposed to be this great legacy absolute nonsense never happened uh, I think the optics of stuff I think like the uh, women's team of the World Cup is a great launch pad but like all those from the people who were down there last night the reports of all the girls that were at, young girls that were at it that's brilliant but if there is no uh, foundation stones in place yeah. in the places that they come from that's dead next week there's no way to harness that and so on that note Noel and I know you've done a little bit of work with the development squads down there over the last number of years like the Waterford's ability to sustain that stuff that you're talking about and to live with the Cork uh, Galway Kilkenny of this world over the next number of years is this um, I'm not saying one and done because I've been there thereabouts over the last few years but are the foundations there for this to be a long term thing with Waterford yeah, absolutely. I, I, I saw in the column about this yesterday. Uh, it's probably been 10, 12 years where I was asked to get involved and go in and do training sessions with, with underage structures within the camogie scene. And at the time, naively, you don't necessarily think too much about it. But when you kind of reflect on it and when you're out of it yourself, you think about how amazing it is and the amount of work that's done, the likes of Eda Murphy, Sheila O'Donoghue, Joey Carton himself, the amount of work that they put in to actually kind of set a bar. Like even, I think it was last year, maybe the year before last, I was out with... Uh, the under 14 team out in Carriganore in, in the arena uh, and uh, I think they had 120 maybe 130 girls out there at a camogie session so the, what they're trying to do is place as much emphasis on trying to engage as many I suppose girls but also clubs at the moment I think there's like 19 clubs camogie clubs in Waterford and, and they're really trying to grow that so what they're doing is they've been very smart and strategic about how they go about that and trying to build a good base and hoping that they can actually bring as many of these young girls you know to a level where you can compete against you know the Corks the Galways the Kennys of today and I think that's really really important because as you said there it's it's fine getting to a final once in 78 years but the reality is what you need sustainability and it's something that certainly we're struggling with on the, on the men's side is is sustainability um 
but they seem to have done their work. They have a really good structure, but more importantly, they have really good people there to support that structure. Uh, and we're really starting to see the benefit of that. And I'm sure that uh, the, the pressure of all that stuff that we're talking about will hopefully be lost on the on the players for the week that's in. They can think about that again down the track uh, if they manage to get over the line. I, there was a couple of comments from um, Waterford's Keeley, uh, Corbett Barry during the week saying that they've come on a lot since the lost Cork in the semis last year. And then I read Eva Murray as well saying that she thought that that Waterford team were calm and mature almost sort of beyond uh, beyond their years and the way they came back against Tipperary. There's always that cliche and all about like, you know, you have to get to it. You lose a final to win one. But like they've they've been so close over the last few years, it feels like even though they are underdogs, it is there for them to grasp it. Absolutely, and like you know, you often and it not frustrates me, but it kind of gets me thinking. You know, when people kind of suggest like that, oh, there's, there's nothing to lose, but the reality is, there's everything to lose. Mm. You know, when you're in an All Ireland final, you want to win. When you're in semi finals, you want to win. From watching last year's match, I think that Cork only went ahead in the last year's semi-final with like four minutes to go where Watford led the whole game and obviously it was the substitutions of like Fashion Thompson etc that made that change but in the end of it I think it was like 10 points to, to 15 so it was a 10 point swing but ironically enough things weren't going particularly well this year in the semi-final against Tipperary uh, particularly like in the first half they really really struggled at times and it was down to the Tipperary pressure their physicality etc but in fairness to them you know they held their cool which was very mature for a re- very kind of young team when you broadly look at the, the profile of the of the squad, they were very mature. They got the goal when they needed, but in the second half, they showed an incredible uh, amount of resilience, but also maturity to be able to stick to their game plan. And when things weren't going particularly well for some players, even the likes of seeing Orla Hickey going from midfield back to full back at times, it goes to show like that these players are very well trained, they're managed. You see Sean Power is a very good backroom team in place and that's what you're going to need to have if you want to win the All-Ireland. Because look, we're not kind of trying to call anyone here. That car team, I think Sarah was on with you during the week, said have probably underperformed since 2018. Um, but they're an incredible squad. They've three All-Stars on, on the bench that they can spring at any time. Um, so Watford are probably under no illusions that it's going to be an incredibly tough battle. But I'm sure it's one they're going to grasp and, and definitely do themselves just as, as much as they can What's the morale generally Noel in, ter- in Camogie in terms of I suppose it, it doesn't feel as if Camogie has been quite on the same sort of upward trajectory in terms of the um, publicity as ladies football what do you make of it? Yeah I suppose look there's probably not as many teams competing mm. uh, that's probably because of the dominance of the likes of Cork or Dublin or Kilkenny or Wexford like I was looking at the, the list of honours like Warford have never won the All-Ireland like Cork have won 28 Dublin have won what 24 Kilkenny 15 etc and we look down through well, Galway have only won 4 so even though we talk about Galway being one of the top 3 teams or maybe 2 teams uh, in Camogie at the moment they've only won 4 all Ireland it's quite similar to senior actually for senior men's yeah, and, and like when you when you look at when you look at things like that, you're kind of saying to yourself, you know, that's a bit of a challenge to try and get as many teams engaged and trying to win uh, Camogie. Whereas the ladies' football seems to be there's there's probably like four or five, maybe even six teams that are very similar standard uh, that can win the All Ireland, and that certainly entices more teams to engage in that as well. But from your perspective, just very briefly, like what what can the GA do generally to get Hurlan and Camogie? Like Hurlan is the most underplayed sport in the world, really. Like it's a disgrace that Hurlan is 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 almost an irrelevance in in the three quarters of the counties in the in the country, considering it's it's probably the best field sport in the world. So what can like I remember as a kid, you know, I was from Northeast Galway, which would be a football area really. But guys used to come to the school and we'd we'd play we'd practice our Hurlan skills at a very early age, and it definitely helped. What can the GA do? I don't think there's a, a simple solution. Um, and ironically enough, I always go back when someone says this to me, I always go back. I remember reading uh, Michael Minan's book, GA Economics, I think it's called. And at the time, uh, I thought it was kind of a strange comment, but Sean Kelly, who is now MEP, he was the former president of the GA, he mentioned that like intercounty teams can't do both. And at the time, I was kind of sort of, surely like the likes of your Galways, your Dublins, your Corks, like that have massive, you know, clubs, uh, participation levels, funding, etc., can surely compete at both. But when you actually drill down into it, they can't. And that's probably the struggle, is I don't think you can actually compete well at both. If you have like Dublin, Dublin's population must be a million, is it? Approximately a million, maybe a well over. Million, probably give or take. Uh, I was talking to someone, I was actually at the football final last week and I was talking to someone, I won't mention names, and his little girl is playing in the FINA and in the academy, they had 760 kids. So I'm thinking to myself, 
they've 760 kids. If they can't compete at boats, it's going to be very challenging for others to compete at boats. So what I would say is, I'd say inter-county county boards realise that, that they can't do boats, so they'll probably stick with what they're using. So the status quo is probably football because that's what most have probably played traditionally. So it's going to be a very difficult one to try and coax teams that will be traditionally Gaelic football out of Gaelic football and into Ireland. And that's, again, a generational thing where it's not going to be like a, a two or three year, you know, plan where you're going to see, you know, somebody compete against the likes of your Limerickshire, Corkshire, Waterford, etc. It's going to be a longer, you know, battle to try and get people to that where you're going to go Ricky Rackard, etc. all the way up to try and yeah. do that. I know Liam Griffin had, uh, we spoke to him a few months ago, uh, God, it could even be the back end of last year, but some pretty interesting proposals to address to address that exact issue. To like um, call clubs out about having a, a specific commitment to playing both sports up to a certain level. I, I d- just in relation to this game particularly, um, I was interested to see like uh, we were talking about sort of Waterford obviously being underdogs there, and the hunger came up, and the uh, core captain was asked about that, and she was equating the fact that um, Waterford have never won the title with Cork's drought of the last five years which I think is a uniquely Cork outlook yeah and you know what I think that Sarah mentioned it I think she was on a show on Wednesday but she mentioned that this team since 2018 have underperformed and they probably have when you look at the calibre of players they have bear in mind in the last two years they lost last year's final by what was it a pint and the previous by three points so it's not as if they've been too far away but from a, from I suppose a traditionalist point of view like Cork have always been there there but it's obviously that's reflective in having won whatever 28 titles so you know, that's probably like the Dublin footballers where they're saying for the last three years they haven't won it. So for Dublin, it's it, for, for Cork and Mogi, it's probably been a long period of time. Mm. So I can completely understand that from the Cork perspective. But from a Warford perspective, uh, wouldn't it be amazing, I suppose, what they're thinking to be the, the first winners of an Ireland title? And bear in mind also, like if you look at it from, I suppose you've drilled down deeper, like Isle Tier have been very successful. Like they won obviously the All Ireland Club. I, I know it's at intermediate level. Uh, three years ago, they were they won the Munster. Obviously, that same year, they won the Munster the year after. They got better in the semi final off the Offaly crowd that bet them in uh, the other that they bet in the All Ireland previous to that. And De La Salle won their first uh, county title last year and done really well in Munster. So I do think that that's something that's really important as well that you're starting to see a big level of commitment but also outside where that also gives Warford a bit of impetus to say you know we are actually competing at a really good level here so even though that Cork feel like they've been starved since 2018 I think that Warford feel that it wouldn't be a great thing to be the first team to, oh, to win yeah. in our Ireland well a Cork, a Cork person says that and actually fully believes it uh, well the rest of us can sort of from the outside look in and think wow that's a, that's quite the quite the dollop of uh, self-awareness there uh, Sarah Donovan you mentioned her and obviously she spoke a little bit about the Cork bench yesterday did they stick it, stick or twist in terms of some of the players that are there you mentioned Ashing Thompson but one of those uh, number one what's your sense of that and um, I mean I was going to ask you for a prediction after that but I'm, I'm going to assume I know, uh, know the answer to that one um, yeah, it, no, do you know what? And I was thinking about this when I when I was listening. It, it's very hard, like, for a manager to be in a situation like they have obviously three all stars: Orla Cronin, obviously Ashton Thompson, and Eve Laura Hayes, who are incredible players and have been incredible service for servants to to Cork. If they decide to to twist and go and start the tree, and they don't win, there's probably more damage than than good in that sense. Um, because obviously this team has got them to the all the final. So mm-hmm. I think they're probably more impactful off the bench, and we've seen that. And obviously last year, as I said, when Warford were doing really well and, and they were winning by five points, bringing on Ashley Thompson quite literally changed the game. And even la- even the last day against Galway, and they brought on Ashley Thompson with, what, like 10, 15, maybe 20 minutes to go, she changed the game. She calmed things down. I remember she picked up a ball in her own full back line, and she more or less waltzed out to three or four people and just passed it to the far side of the pitch. It was up the far side and it was a score. And... So that's a sign of really good players where she seems that she has a lot of time in the ball and very comfortable and quite literally just runs through three or four players and, and it's up the pitch. Uh, so, yeah, I would stick with what, what has been successful and have those in in, in the foreign, in the foreign line. Um, the score, I think that... I think it'll actually be very, very close. Uh, over the last number of years, it's been nip and tuck between Warford and Cork. I know Warford better early on uh, in the season. I'm going to say... Warford by a pint after extra time. Well, oh, very specific. Well, uh, you'll look like Nostradamus and all if that uh, if that comes off, which is the the benefit. And if it doesn't, we'll never hear from it again, which is the beauty of the way these things work. Absolutely. Uh, pleasure chatting to you. Thanks, a million.
It's great to talk to you lads Have a great morning It's a lot The games by the way On Sunday Clare tip in the junior final 12.50 at Crow Park Derry Meath 2.45 in the intermediate And then that game We've been discussing In the senior final 5 o'clock Sunday evening At Crow Park Cork Up against Waterford uh, We're going to turn our attention To rugby in just a few minutes time But a few comments That have come into to us uh, Over the course Of the morning Shifty lad Good morning to you Shifty Watched highlights of the Derry game They played very well Totally deserved uh, Plus far more exciting Listening to foreign commentary As they bring an excitement yeah. To their job Wow well, good commentary In Finnish uh, Jesus, yeah. shots fired. Um, um, where does the lack of goal scoring stem from in Irish football? The men's team, the women's team, League of Ireland teams in Europe, we're all the same. There is like there's generally uh, this I is uh, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't underplay this. Like seriously, it's not. And a lot of the, um, I mean, I'm, what did Ireland have seven shots on target? I know we're playing very conservatively, but we don't. We've we just produced like one of the hottest striking properties mm. in Europe. Who? In Evan Ferguson. Yeah, but don't don't be big enough too much now. No, but, but uh, I'm I'm just saying, right? Like uh, I, I, and even if he wasn't uh, there, I'd p- probably still be making the same point that, given the size of the country we have, given the competitiveness of the different sports that we have, right? We're not fully focused on soccer here. There's a lot of other sports taking up the resources. What do you want? Like, the it's League of like, Ireland is bereft of good strikers. I know, but like, but, but for those reasons, what I'm saying, like, mm-hmm. of course, of course, it's not to say. Uh, that we shouldn't be doing something to encourage more people in that area to be better players and to stock up those teams going forward. And I'm sure the academies at the League of Ireland, I'm sure they're doing all that. Like You'd have to assume that like uh, purely from a financial point of view, they're the players that can make most money if they end up being sold on. But I just don't know that we should be saying Irish... I, I, I'm extrapolating from the content that Shane is sort of saying, well, like that's our lot as Irish people. Sure, we can, How can we produce a striker? which is historically not true and currently not true. Well, yeah, but Evan, Evan is still very young. Um, but like the, the, across the game, we were bereft of strikers. Really, we are like the, the in the League of Ireland. Chris Forrester and Max Matt have been top scorers. Matt is not Irish. Chris Forrester is not a striker. Um, and Rovers have scored one goal in seven, and that was a penalty. Um, and the one thing you'd say about Derry, who've had serious problems up front themselves, they've had to um, change between McGonagall and Kavanagh. They 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 approach the game with it was they weren't remotely negative. Like they weren't they they were. S- just so positive the way they approached it and that reminded me a bit of Vinny's Dundalk team that basically it, was, it wasn't it was like Vinny says you score three we score four I um, enjoyed but, that actually but, the, but the, 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 there, there was an element like it was a crazy game last night the Derry game it was like there were so many incidents notwithstanding the goals but their, appro- their approach was so positive I was glad they were rewarded there was no conservatism in the way they played yeah. whatsoever uh, Danny Mack League of Ireland is way overrated by some media Rovers proof this prove this every year in Europe uh, C Bracken says weak sided uh, weak oh sorry on the underrated skill bit that we spoke about at the top of the show uh, the weak sided stick pass uh, yeah um, Adrian I think the debate uh, straw that was drawn pre-program I think the debate I know I'm reading this wrong uh, it was drawn pre-program but Katie was just plainly wrong I feel sorry for Powell being undermined and whispers during uh, uh, from the players wouldn't help uh, that's not losing over uh, boom, 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 boom. Uh, Cullum spot on says a comment that's been sent through to us here um, by the producer of the show uh, from Keen Row <laughs> captains do it every week and nothing is made of it uh, this is about the Katie McCabe Vera Powell stuff Thiago Silva Henderson all these types of players 100% give their opinions and the managers almost definitely tell them to F off yeah I, I'd I just completely agree with what Vinny said on it I think Katie McCabe that she's let herself down here and she was above her station she's not the manager it'd be grand if Vera Powell wasn't um the contract wasn't up for grabs yeah. it wasn't the end of the it world it undermines her and it certainly in my view it undermined Katie McCabe as well because you don't do that yeah alright let's uh, turn our attention to rugby because uh, the World Cup is basically uh, kicking off give or take a couple of months tomorrow with uh, Ireland's interest in the warm up games uh, starting against Italy and uh, delighted to say James Tracy is on the line morning James morning James how are you getting on? on yeah not too bad not too bad um, as you were saying there pumped uh, finally finally here uh, I feel like we've been chatting about it for ages so yeah uh, excited to to get to get our teeth stuck into it and for a pile of players in the team like it does feel like uh, here's your chance yeah and, and uh, looking by the team that was selected uh, that's definitely the way they've gone they've gone with uh, like some interest in pairings but obviously trying to build a lot of continuity uh, I think like Probably the most interesting one uh, would be maybe Darius at seven. Um, like 
I look at the squad when it first came out and you're 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 seeing like probably don't have an out and out seven after uh Van der Fleer. Oh man, he's probably the obvious choice um to go in there as as kind of like cover uh if, if Van der Fleer was to get injured and then um you're looking kinda who's next and, and maybe Doris is, is probably the next in line to uh to fill that jersey if need be. So good for him to get miles uh miles in the clock in the jersey and uh interesting back row on paper like you you look at Baird he's kind of like a Tom Croft uh, of all type type uh six um and then Conan you know who's like a you know test Lions test number eight and, and I feel like only for Doris having uh, the the season of his life he, he would have uh, been unbelievably prominent last year so he, he's getting a good run um to, to put his hand up uh, at the start of it but yeah I don't know what, what are your thoughts lads are you you're excited the the back row is full of class yeah yeah there is a bit of that uh, albeit like I'm not sure is what Andy Farrell is thinking obviously for the games that run after this is this sort of last chance saloon and then after this we get a bit serious about the teams that we're starting to pick or what do you think how do you th- how do you see playing out from those games after this uh, I would say last chance saloon but I'd say it's more rewarding lads for, for what they've done in training you know uh, like Joe McCarthy getting his first start I think he burst onto the scene uh, was you know and, and he kind of hasn't really looked back from that that point of view I think he, he probably um, is getting an opportunity with, with an older head um, in Henderson beside him which is always a, a great thing to do like you look at the at the bench they've done that with uh, with Healy um, and Furlong uh, with, with Tom Stewart and it's, it's just such a a settler for a young fella playing the biggest game of their life having two old heads have been there a million times um, and it'll give them the best opportunity to, to put their hands up and be a bolter uh, to make their way into that starting 23 because I feel like from what we've seen uh, over the last two years it'll be hard to break into that starting 15 especially uh, unless you have an unbelievable next few games From the outside looking in right, it's really hard to get a handle on how those conversations go during the week on this topic because we tend to use it as a bit of a cliche I've just used one there is it last chance saloon right? but like actually internally I wanted to get a bit of a fix on how that plays out and so I was looking at your Ireland caps last night and I think I'm right to say the one start was against Japan in 2017 in a game that like there was a lot of people uh, Marmion, and John Ryan Treadwell funny enough uh, one of them that got a shot um, under Josh Smith was it like expl- is, how explicit are those conversations in that week leading up to the game in terms of the opportunity that's it it, it just put on a especially from my experience anyway it was put on the plate just been like you know you've you've gotten yourself to this point um, and, and here you go now take your opportunity make sure you you do the best which you can with your time in the jersey and, and that's what you want uh, I'm excited this week uh, especially to see um, the partnership Casey and, and Crowley uh, I feel like Casey was um, like he had, a, he had a very 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 strong game the last time Ireland played Italy in the Six Nations. Uh, he was he was obviously with Byrne that day. I feel like building partnerships with uh, with players who are in your own provinces is is is, uh, is invaluable because you just get so many more minutes with each other, so many more reps, whether it be in training, whether it be week to week. That you have you go through the bad days together, you go through the good days together, and you just grow as a unit. I think keeping them together is um, it's, it's a good idea for Munster it's a good idea for Ireland long term but excited to see how they go because they're going to, both going to want to be pushing for uh, to be you know pushing for the maybe the 23 and, and uh, looks like maybe they've you know kept Murray and uh, and Byrne together but you know again I'm hypothesizing there but yeah. um, for the for these two lads the, the more they build that relationship they'll come as a package then you know and and, and that can only be a good thing for Ireland, Irish rugby what if Crowley, that, what just, if Crowley, just, yeah. just one on, on, on I just want to follow up on the point that you made about the 2017 game was that a conversation with Joe James uh, it depends right so you know he wouldn't necessarily have an individual conversation with every player but like throughout that was a tour so throughout the tour you've plenty of opportunities to sit down you know, whether you're, whether you're in the video room, whether you're whatever, mm-hmm. it was kind of like, you're going to get an opportunity at some point, you know, make sure okay. you take it. it was kind of the conversation I'd had. It wasn't specifically what game. We hadn't played any games at this point. 
Yeah. Um, so it was trained well and uh, you'll get an opportunity to make sure you take it when you do. So, so it doesn't need saying at the time. And then afterwards, how did you go in the game and what happens afterwards in terms of, like, obviously you're analysing the hell out of it in your head, I'm sure, afterwards as to what sort of an impression you've made. Uh, yeah, and it didn't go amazingly well. It wasn't a, a complete sinker, but it wasn't amazingly well. Uh, but yeah, you're you're going to be like overthinking it massively, you know, especially if it doesn't go well. So, um yeah, I, I just remember, you know, there was a million things I wish I could have done better and all that different things. And I probably, a lot of players would have that that self-talk after games, even if you would be perceived when you watch the video back, you're like, I actually didn't have as bad a game as I thought I had. But uh, yeah, it's always that battle with your own self-talk. Of you, you always concentrate on the things you could have done better versus look at the bigger picture when you watch it back and you're like, okay, actually was happy enough with the, a lot of things I did well there and I can fix up those little things. But for these lads going in, it's going to be, uh, they, they love what, the, you know, they've gone through two blocks of like really, really tough preseason training. It, they, they know they're going to be blown. So it's just getting the kind of cobwebs uh, blown off, making sure that they're nailing down on, on the stuff that they said they're going to do. You know, we all uh, sit down, you know, each team, I'm sure at the start of uh, each block and you're like, Everyone wants to win the World Cup. Okay, how are we going to get there? Talk about all the things, all the boxes we're going to tick, what we're going to do on the pitch, what we're going to do for each other. Um, so it's actually not making that be lip service and backing it up on the pitch um, with your actions. I think that that's one thing as like non-professional sports players that we, we never think about enough, the terrible beauty of being able to watch yourself back and like watch a game like from, and, 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 and almost probably thinking how did that go and watching it back and then revising your opinion or seeing something that like Jesus I, I screwed up there like and it's like it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to have but it can be um, I guess it can be like strange watching yourself back as well but on another point what's he looking for here from Crowley like in terms of if he's envisioning in his head the World Cup and he's like we're going to get situations at out half where you know we'll, we we may need our second or third choice out half so what, what's he looking for here in the sense of I know you're, you're obviously going to expect to beat Italy but what's what the, the Crowley situation for me is fascinating where, he, where he's emerged in this situation now so what I'm looking for out of him anyway is to control the game so Ireland uh, have a very um, structured uh, attack and plan um, and you know he needs to fit in really well and that you feel like you know when we're at our best playing on top teams and it just looks easy and I, I think watching him play at the tail end of of, uh, of Munster season that's the Crowley we want to see playing is just comfortable playing you know whether with the right thing in place so whether it's a cross field kick when the defence is closing whether it's playing the right pass so just being comfortable bossing the team um, kicking his goals like and you know it's make it like too simplified in it but just being the best version of him from what we've seen already at the end of, of monster season and the glimpses we've seen of him in a green jersey that's what we want to see you don't want to see he doesn't need to be man of the match he just needs to be really really good in his uh, core roles and I feel like making everyone else look look better and, and that's exactly what you want from him because Sexton's going to start if he's fit so it's who is going to be the the next in line, whatever happens, and uh, it's you know it's it's up for grabs. You know at the moment I I have Burn in in at number two, but who's who's we've got a few games here for for him to, to change my mind uh, on that, and uh, I'm, I'm sure it's you know because it's so close, I'm sure it's pretty even split on on who most people think should be the number two but mm. uh, I think Burn edges him at the minute especially with like miles on the clock and stuff like that and just general how he fits into how they play but he's now at a whole pre-season in there with them he's going to have he's the first opportunity here he's playing with his pal who he's got more reps than anyone else with as at scrum half so he's got every opportunity and excited to see where he goes it's, it's an interesting one psychologically isn't it because you're trying to you're trying to at once like um, make a real case for yourself here but without being flashy at the same time yeah and that's that's the struggle really is uh like Joe Schmidt used to have a line before, or he used to we used to have a subs meeting before uh, international games, and his line w- to us was fit in first. So don't feel like you have to do something extraordinary 
just because you're in on a new stage it's you're here for a reason keep doing the same thing that's got you here and uh i think that's probably um something you know he'll have in the back of his mind just do my role he's like he he stuff will come naturally to him anyway you know he doesn't need to try and make stuff up uh i feel like he's a he's a he's a quality player so it'll come naturally to him fit in first is a good a good one what was the when you saw the team yesterday give us your first thought when you saw rob herring at hooker um yeah, no, I, 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 I would have expected, uh, to be honest, for him to to be in there, and then uh, I, I think the the ones where I was kind of surprised slash uh, very happy about to see was um, Stockdale and uh, and Earl's partnership back in the wing. I think like that's an exciting one that we haven't seen for a long time, um, and I'm hoping for for Stockdale especially that he can get his mojo back at international level you know he was unplayable for for a few seasons and and uh just that sport you know sometimes you you lose your momentum and hopefully he'll be able to get it back and hope he gets early, a few early scores or a few big moments in the game just to get to stockdale that, that uh you know that iconic uh try against new zealand the chip, the chip and chase like those, those moments you know you want to get that that guy back I've never asked a former hooker about a hooker before and he moves on immediately to talk about a winger. <laughs> <laughs> oh, listen. <laughs> Rob, Rob's, he's, uh, he, like, battled it out with him for, for years. You know, he, he's, uh, he's, he's going to be a leader at, um, in that group, definitely. Uh, I think for him, it's, it's more taking your opportunities when you can because you're the who have just set the bar so high yeah. um, it's not not an easy spot to be in where you know the fit in first probably doesn't doesn't uh, go for him as much where he probably does need to do things outside of his game to push the off thing but I don't think he's going to do that like I wouldn't if I was him I wouldn't be chasing stuff that's not my remit like he's you know what you're going to get with him he's going to be unbelievably accurate with his line out he's going to be a leader around the pitch he's great at scrum time um, he, he's a real nuts and bolts player where you know what you're going to get from him I think yeah. like when Ireland have needed him over the last three years, he's come up in spades with huge moments, whether it be big tries, big throws at the end of games. Um, can't say I, I've been jealous of looking at him taking those big moments, and, and he's been he's been exceptional. So, um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> can't say you have been jealous, or can't say you haven't been jealous. Sorry, <laughs> I, I can't say I haven't been jealous. I've definitely been jealous. I'm being honest there, but uh, you know you have to take your hat off every now and again because he's uh, he's continually stepped up when he's been asked for, especially in the range shirt. Just one last one for me. Uh, you touched on Sexton earlier on, and I was interested to hear Paul O'Connell's comments during the week about his uh, Sexton's obsessive approach to rugby, um, saying that he watches everything that moves, that he's you know back in talking about every game. Was that your experience on a Monday or Tuesday? He's back in talking about whatever games happened, and and O'Connell was um, framing that in the sense that like this will be fine. Like he's obsessive about this thing. He'll be full bore in training and. This will all be fine. He was uh, trying to reassure a nation. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I for one didn't need any reassurance ever uh, from from knowing him. But yeah, listen, he's like a, a Michael Jordan esque type uh, person, character, player, generational talent. I I have no worry in the world. And to answer your question, like obsessed is an understatement. Like he's what is he? He's thirty seven, thirty eight, still playing the game at the the highest level you kind of have to be obsessed to be able to have the drive to, to do that. So uh, that in itself says it, says it all, but I'm not one bit surprised. You know, that he, he's, a, he's a captain of his country and I can't put into words how much it means to the man. And to anyone, it's a huge honour to captain your country. But he, that was for him, it was it was just, it was the, the ice on the cake to, to an amazing career. But it wasn't just... I'm okay. I've done that. You know, I'm done. Like he wants to win the World Cup, and I, 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 I don't know if if uh, many of past captains have had the firepower and the team and the belief to actually believe they can do it. I know in my heart that he knows that they can do it. This this team can do it, and, and uh, that is the most motivating thing in the world. Never mind, he's already. Uh, an obsessed freak um, yeah. and a perfectionist and, and everything you need to be to be one of the best in the world probably a stupid question like does he does he chat to Crowley about the the experience of Saturday and what give him a little bit of advice 
you know what? I would say if Crowley seeked it out, he, he would 100% give it. Uh, maybe if he felt it was right, he might give it. But uh, I, I don't think Crowley would necessarily need it. You know, I, I feel like he's played in big games. So um, it's more he would, again, I'm just guessing here, but you, you kind of you go hard on each other in training and that's how you prepare. You know, he's going to have to train against Johnny and train him and Johnny's going to be going hundred percent. So if you can deal with Johnny at hundred percent and the team that's coming against you, you'll be well prepped for, for the weekend. And that's more a way of, of preparing and passing on, uh, especially to someone who's in your position. Mm. And, you know, like the, the, the best thing you can do for them uh, is is be hard on them and, and be hard on each other because that's only going to make everyone else better. So uh, sometimes words aren't necessarily necessary. Sometimes they are, uh, but I, I could imagine Crowley would have would have just been uh, pushed to the limit in training from from everyone, especially from from the other eight halves. And his experience with Munster and his, his, his little bit of experience with Ireland would have set him up well. But if he if he had any questions to ask Johnny, I can guarantee you that door would be open to to any knowledge you want to know. Yeah. All right. Well, it'll be the first of many chats I'm sure we'll have over the coming weeks and months. James, thanks a million. Good man. I'll chat to you soon. Thanks a lot, James Tracy on the line there, former Leinster hooker. Some interesting stuff in addition to the team uh, to play Italy tomorrow and uh, looking further ahead. Who do you have as a second choice out half at the moment? It's a good question. Probably Ross Byrne. Like, I am interested in James' comment there about we'll see how he goes over the next few days, Crowley, uh, weeks, Crowley. Um, and maybe there's a case for putting him in. I do wonder if... Um, yeah, it'd be just interesting, like Crowley finished the season so well, Munster finished the season so well, that wasn't really the case for Ross Byrne, certainly on a team point of view. There was certainly people critical of him Yeah. Uh, uh, after the way Leinster's season panned out. Maybe all of that wasn't, um, especially in relation to the potential drop goal at the end of the leinster yeah. Shell game. Maybe that wasn't all. Maybe there was a nuance to that that people weren't um, fully sort of on top of, but... Uh, I do wonder, like, because uh, that's the last real competitive game where Andy Farrell gets an opportunity to have a look and sit, make up his mind. Mm. And I wonder, has he made up his mind? And I wonder how much um, importance they'll put on these games. Tough for Joey Carberry to be in this position now where he's kind of looking he's on. He's gone, it's like... Mm. It is tough. Even yeah. from a Munster point of view. Yeah. Um, mm. Uh, right up we are going to turn our attention back to football next it's quarter past nine and uh, during the ads you're going to hear from Emma Byrne and Kathleen McNamee on the very latest episode of the Coy Gig Pod where they'll discuss Ireland's uh, ongoing issues in attack the Coy Gig Pod on OTB in association with Cadbury official snack partner to the Republic of Ireland's women's national uh, national team and off the back of that uh, we're going to be joined in the studio by the former Ireland international Maeve de Burka to pick through the bones of the homecoming last night and pull, uh, put a full stop on Ireland's World Cup campaign you're listening to OTB AM. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? I think it was a very, very good season for me to be able to get the amount of games that I was able to get, get the experience that I was able to get, and um, you know, also to prove that I, I can play at that level. Some of my best games were against some of the top teams in the world. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app. We didn't look madly any closer to scoring a goal, I don't think, unless you viewed that slightly differently. No, we didn't. Um, but the fact that we were dominating in the middle towards the, the final third was a massive step for me. And you can't expect everything to come at once because it was so frustrating that we we were at one stage defence kicking the ball along to nobody and chasing it down I mean that's a big step up today and I think step by step we we're good defensively we're solid now when we win the ball back can we transition to to forward play can we move through the from the defensive um, third to the middle third that's the first step we've done we've done that really well today I'm really confident with the midfield play from today um, and then the next step was talking about your getting, creating those chances, getting on the end of them. You know, and I guarantee you there isn't much work done on that because as a manager, as a coach, you always work on your defensive side first, always. And we had to tweak that a little bit. We had to make sure we were hard to beat. That's the first thing you work on. So the last thing you work on, or one of the last things is that you work on your attack and play. And then you talk about, 
your whatever you're going to do, whether it's counterattack, whatever it is. Um, and that, you know, that's something that, again, it's positive because with Denise, when Denise was getting up there, like she was getting into lovely little areas. Then we're talking about decision making. We're talking about when to release the ball. Then we're talking about when to make those runs because you know your your wingers. You know when they're going to release the ball. All of these things have to come, and they'll come with a little bit more work. And um, but it's really positive. That's the easy part because everybody wants to do attack and play. So you don't have to motivate anybody. You don't have to encourage people to to get the best out of them. That's the fun part of training. OTB. AM. The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. 8,000 people on O'Connell Street last, last night to uh, welcome home the Republic of Ireland after the World Cup, and amongst them was Maeve de Barca, former Ireland International. Maeve, welcome to the studio. Thanks so many for having me. What was it buzz like? It looked very good. What was it buzz like down there last night? Yeah, it was nice for the girls, I think, just to get a taste of what they, I suppose, what the, the crowds were doing back home, you know, and how much support they had back home because they were in such a bubble over there in Australia and they wouldn't have gotten to experience that. Mm. So it was nice, yeah, for them just to, to get a taste of it last night. Um, and everybody was a body language expert to what did, did, did they look at each other was there interaction what was said yeah it was kind of funny because initially they brought the management of year and the management out on stage mm. and then they all went back off stage and then the yeah. players came on separately and um, they all got individually introduced to the crowd which was nice and a few players the American based had to go back to their clubs straight away so they weren't there but yeah it was interesting to see the interactions but then later Vera came back on the stage with the players so yeah it seemed to be all fairly amicable anyway yeah and we're reading in like a lot into what she said stick with us we'll, we will win medals at tournaments and we, is that the Royal Us or is that like yeah. are you hanging around um, she certainly not you know uh, was full bore into the party last night and uh, if the FAI are of a mind uh, to move on from her after this, she's certainly not going to make it easy for them. What, what he's trying to say there is, what did you make of the dance? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm establishing the start of the show. I don't know what with the dance. I preferred Amber singing myself. <laughs> but, but she's she not saying, she she's the not the saying they're going, oh, it's been brilliant, thanks a million, you've been so warm, and she's saying, no, no, we're, we're, on we go. For her, it didn't seem like any bit of closure or final goodbye or anything yeah. like that. It was more a continuation, which is um, was, I suppose, slightly surprising. But then again, yeah, like you said, she's not kind of ready to say goodbye yet as such. But it does seem like, um, you know, from looking at from the outside in that the writing's on the wall for her, I think. Mm. Why is it? Uh, just I suppose when you know players are asked do they support her and they decline to comment then um, you know maybe it's, it's a bit telling really that you know they don't doesn't seem to be that support there for mm. her and I think when you lose the dressing room I'm not sure if there's you know it's it's very difficult I think to continue after that it's funny that they, you say lost the dressing room but Ireland aren't they're not playing badly either at the same time no they aren't and like they're, they're actually their performances over in Australia were great and I, I do think if it, like it's keep been repeated but if it was a, a purely football decision I think she'd be in it would be a no brainer she obviously brought us to their first major tournament she did the same with the Dutch back in the day she brought them to their first um, Euros as well so she definitely has a football pedigree you know but I suppose when a player is essentially banned or sorry a manager she's essentially banned from working in the NWSL the um, US League at the moment until um, the allegations are cleared against her then um, I think I think really just the end of the day what needs to happen is the, the internal review and ask the players what mm. they're thinking themselves mm. Yeah, the language of the statement certainly didn't suggest that this was um, you d- I don't think you word a statement that way if you feel that the outcome might be that she's staying on so we'll have to take a watch and brief on that it does uh, bizarrely we're sort of in a position for the reasons that you've outlined where we may well end up losing a manager and yet the bar for whoever comes in after that has actually been set really high like the expectations now into those uh, Northern Ireland and Hungary games in September like if we're not getting six points in the Nations League out of that suddenly it's like you know no matter who it is that's there what was all that about? Yeah, they have big shoes to fill, you know. Um, in fairness, Vera did do, like I said, exceptional job results-wise. And it is, um, it's, a, it's a job that so someone would need to think a lot about before taking on. Obviously, if it was, it was an Irish person, it would be a huge honour or as a well, you know, a well-experienced um, manager from abroad as well. I'm sure a lot of people would jump at the opportunity. But like you said, it's a bit of a tricky one to go into because there, we have been on such a, I suppose, such a wave of excitement as well. And like the 
results like we did mention you know narrow losses and the draw to Nigeria they were great considering the opposition we were up against so yeah the new manager will, will be up against it I think I did, had a little bit of a look around last night because it hasn't been a huge amount of chat and like why would there be when somebody is still technically in a job but not a huge amount of chat about who the replacement might be, might be. and I looked at the odds um, and admittedly Tom Elms and Eileen Gleeson are the first two names on the list and I think there would be a bit of obviously continuity about that and potentially welcome but it really struck me that we just need to be very careful what we wish for beyond that because you know um, Phil Neville was number three on the list Colin Bell um, who you know uh, obviously did a job for a period of time I don't think was particularly pined for after he was gone uh, and 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 a litany of names after that. I you know beyond the top two, and maybe there's a less obvious option out there, but definitely a little bit of be careful what we wish for here. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think yeah, both Eileen and and Tom. Eileen would have worked as an assistant before um, she went to Glasgow. Now she's obviously working in the FAI as well. Mm-hmm. So I think both of them <clears throat> would be great appointments, like you said, for the continuity, and they'd be familiar with the the women's game in Ireland as well. It's a point that I'm always kind of harping on about a little bit. I know the the manager always seems to have the job in isolation of just looking after the national team when there doesn't seem to be any kind of p- the progression of the pathway within um, God, Ireland. God, where did we hear that before? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, I know mad. it's like a broken record. But I think I really think that the yeah the success of a domestic league you know in turn ripples has a ripple effect onto the national team because we can see it you know with um, I would say the likes of Germany but that wouldn't have well, <laughs> that's not a yesterday but, you might have said yeah that. exactly uh, you know France all the top league the top nations do have uh, strong domestic leagues so from that point of view I think um, it would be good but yeah the likes of um, yeah Colin Bell did a job yesterday against Germany as well but mm. I I wouldn't foresee that he'd come back I'm not sure obviously what's the statement in the League of Ireland then we'll say if you look at like off the top of my head even closer to home Don O'Reardon Alan Murphy Collie O'Neill have gone from the men's to the women's game but like what managers are is there is there any manager who could say like that he or she would be good enough to do this job or is there a groundswell in the League of Ireland that we're good enough to do this yeah I mean like John O'Reardon he's a former manager of mine he has the pro licence and um, he's as qualified as they come you know the likes of him of course um, could be a possibility too um, so there is definitely yeah we have I think it is one of the kind of uh, shining lights of the FAIs their coach education department have been through myself and they do do um, implement really good courses and I think the quality of co- coaching has definitely improved I would kind of maybe classify as similar to Iceland in that regard they have a really really mm. strong um, for such a small nation they have such a strong um, coaching infrastructure and um, yeah there's there's plenty of names it's hard to think off the top of my head but uh, there's there's plenty of qualified coaches within the country I you're think. saying yeah. it's more than managing the senior team this is a bit of a bigger role than that because obviously it's like it is a bit of a root branch top to bottom as well like yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to see it as a broader role, but I mm. don't think, I think usually they are just, th- th- that's the issue, I suppose, their, their job is solely to focus on the national team and get results, so mm. it's only ever going to be a short-term or a medium-term plan, there's never going to be a long-term plan. If you're in a job and you need to get results, it really doesn't matter what the grassroots levels are doing because they're never going to impact your um, success. So Does the style of football matter? Um, it's hard to tell because I mean in this World Cup we've seen defences really um, outshine the attacks mm. in a way like and there is three teams like I was saying there that, that are in three countries that are in without having conceded a goal they're in the, the round of 16 so um, for me personally as much as we'd love us to be, I'd love us to be playing expansive attack in football I mean there's also your, your leading yourself to be um, open for to get hammered as well mm. and that's something that going over to the World Cup I don't think we were ever going to it was never going to happen really that we were going to get trounced um, five or six mm. nil you know although seeing as how Morocco have gone <laughs> maybe it could have been a good thing get get um, get beaten six nil in your first game and qualify for the round of 16 but um, yeah I think sure yeah it, it would be nice like it was saying the men's team as well it would be nice for us to, to play a lovely brand of football but I think you just need to look at, at the players as well and the, what their strengths are mm. We could have been having very different conversations like if those fine margins um, had just even the narrowest of ones had gone our way the slightest little grain of rice had gone our way um, we might have been talking about a very different 
uh, future I think for Ireland maybe even for it would have been a much more difficult conversation on Vera Pau obviously if uh, they had gone away and we'd also been looking forward to England versus Ireland on Monday morning like I what know. an absolute dream fixture that would have been it really once the, the fixtures were announced that's the one I was eyeing up you know what might be like and it would be huge you know obviously now it's, it's England Nigeria it doesn't have the same ring no. to it for us as Irish fans and it really would have been a great chance because we haven't played um, England in the last 10 or 15 years I can't remember it's, it's longer than that we just never have friendly fixtures against mm. England um, which would obviously be, be a great fixture to have but yeah it's disappointing and you look at the likes of Jamaica who are through to the round of 16 having only scored one goal um, from a set piece so you kind of think maybe what might have been I know yeah. even the likes of Switzerland as well another Another crowd who have kept clean, yeah. t- three clean sheets, only scored two goals. Another crowd, I like that, that crowd. Like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just, yeah, I mean, I suppose you're always going to think, it's not so much regrets, it's just more that like what might have been, maybe had we been handed a different group or had, like you said, maybe an OG not gone in or the penalty not mm-hmm. been conceded, like small margins, but at the end of the day, that's football, I suppose. Nothing, yeah. you know? What uh, chance do you give Nigeria? They obviously gave us a good insight into what they're about and uh, like a team filled with quality, obviously. What chance do you give them because England are looking against the odds last night given uh, some of the bigger uh, lights that have maybe exited the tournament and some that have maybe failed to impress in a way that we thought they might England I think are favourites for it now Yeah I mean their only slight hiccup for want of a better word would be the Haiti 1-0 win but at the same time they got the job done and they got mm. the three points so um, yeah they're definitely I think they're going to stand out in, in the next round Nigeria it's hard to say because I think they took the foot off the gas against us I think they were happy they knew a point would get them through so yeah. I think maybe we didn't see the, the same intensity from Nigeria in the second half against us but um, yeah I'd give them I'd give them a chance but I think for me I think England would be definitely favourites to progress to the quarterfinals there mm, and you have like Swiss against uh, Spain Japan against Norway like all good games what are you in an overall sense now that we know the last 16 who are you thinking I think as well there's standout ties probably Sweden USA as well it's the first yeah. versus the third in the world and they were actually grouped together in the last two World Cups in the group stage so uh, I think one was a nil all draw and then USA came out on top 2 nil as well in the last World Cup so there's a lot of history between those two teams and I don't think both either have like sh- like lit up the tournament as such. Um, USA in particular, they uh, Portugal hit the post in the last minute. So had they scored that, USA would be gone home, which would be. You've huge, not been impressed with the USA at all. No, no. not really, uh, not yet. Anyway, yeah. now a lot of their games also have been at two a.m. So I've watched limited yeah, amounts yeah. of them too. But uh, I, I still think they always find a way. It's just their mentality. They find a way to win no matter mm-hmm. what. And even if it's not pretty, I would probably expect them to to be in the hat in the okay. quarterfinal as well your uh, main takeaway then from last night before we leave you um, obviously we had a bit of a sing song Amber Barrett leading the way on that front we had like the players you know shuffling are you going to uh, you going to retire Neve? and like the sort of oh, I better crack a joke here and just try and get out of this and kick it down the road to another day what was your main uh, takeaway from events last night yeah those kind of questions in a way I'm like oh you know would you just leave leave her alone in a way and let her, her make up her own mind but then I suppose you compare it to the men's game and what would we be asking these questions to, to the men's players and Same it probably probably would be too yeah. so yeah. Fr- from that point of it it's great to see conversations been moved on and such you know uh, interest around the team um, personally I'd love to see Neve stay on um, being a Galway girl as well and we would have played together at Salt Devon I think she has a lot more to give um, f- to Ireland and I think her experience is just um, it's not replaceable you know so personally yeah, I'd love to see her stay on but yeah it was great um, just to, you know great for them to like I said just to have their, their moment and have be able to see the support that was there and hopefully yeah it was a little bit obviously that the Vera thing just kind of hangs a slight cloud over the whole occasion but it was a really good celebration and um, it was great now we can look forward to the Nations League campaign like I said um, starting on the 23rd of September yeah. what did you do today uh, Maeve I analysed a homecoming there we go. <laughs> I actually did much so more it rarely happens, happens yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and we'll have much more to analyse because we'll have events one way or the other over the next few weeks as to whether she's staying or going and then we'll be into September and I think everybody's uh, really excited and looking forward to that um, and again with the Aviva particularly I think for people to get out and show their support uh, post World Cup uh, Maeve thanks a million for dropping in thanks a lot enjoyed that thanks a lot Maeve DeBarca there half past nine uh, it's OTB AM the sports breakfast show from Off The Ball uh, we are nearly out of here but before all that Cameron has joined us in studio morning Cameron morning lads what's the crack what are you doing over there will you not finish up at half, half nine no 
Oh, okay. Well, I just go. Is it? Well, what, what, what is? Thanks your, for coming in, but yeah, cheers, cheers. Tell, tell us what, what's it all about. Well, I was over in Wales a couple of weeks ago for um, a mountain biking event, the Red Bull Hardline, which is known as one of the most difficult um, mountain biking events in the world. So there was a bit of Irish interest this time. Ronan Dunn from um, Wicklow was competing and. Uh, I went over to see what he can do. He's a really interesting guy. We're going to play out with an interview today from him. But uh, it was a fantastic experience. You get to meet all the different athletes that are involved in this. And yeah, you realize that a lot of these guys are a little bit insane because it, like, you go up in the track. We went up in a Land Rover Defender into the Wash Valleys up to this track uh, way up in the mountains. And um, you see across all these jumps, and there are some where it's just like you don't even you're up to maybe a foot off the end of the ramp and you can't see where you're going to land. Jesus, yeah. I presume there's like I've seen some of that stuff. Uh, it comes up on my TikTok feed, which I'll tell you um, maybe yep. all you need to know. Stuff, yeah. But um, your kids were on it, were they? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> they, <laughs> they. I look at those courses, that exact thing that you're describing, and I think, well, there's a muscle memory there, or there's I've run the course, or I've hmm. cycled this course. There's like a I'm taking this hop, but I know every inch of what I need to do off this ramp hmm. to hit where I need to be. Yeah, they do a run or a walk through before the event because uh, they landed in on Wednesday and the event was scheduled for Sunday. Now, unfortunately, the weather meant that there was that the event was cancelled entirely. It was a real shame because it looked like it was going to be brilliant. You went all the way to Wales for an event and it got pulled. Yeah. Nightmare. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, really good fun. <laughs> really, really glad. But I got a, we were flying out of Liverpool, so I got a trip to Anfield out of it, so it's good. I'm supportive of it, but I'm also wondering why. Why? Why I went to Wales for a an event that mountain biking event. I mean, being cancelled was out of your control. Yeah, being uh, you're skeptical of. No, no, I'm 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 supportive of it. Mm. It's just unusual. It is unusual, but I thought um, the way it was pitched was this is this is the one of our from maybe the World Cups that a lot of mountain bikers love taking part in. It was great to see just as a sort of off piece sport, um, if you pardon the pun, mm. um, to see how that works and the passion that's involved and actually the camaraderie in the community that's something that really struck me was a lot of the more experienced riders like G. Atherton or Bernard Kerr were taking all the younger athletes because it is there's a lot of there's a young crop of whom Ronan is a part uh, that are coming through now and the older guys are more than willing to take the guys through the track mm. tell them how to land how you're going to take this jump because it is terrifying and you hear you talk to some of the athletes about some of the injuries and they're so nonchalant about what they've done like oh yeah I broke this one here this this this, like this jockeys few ribs gone yeah you know I got off lightly what's that place down in Limerick called the, the, the biking place in Oh, I really should have looked at this before we, uh, mm -hmm. before we chatted. I was down there for years ago. It's uh, trail biking and okay. it's savage, like mm. brilliant. Mm. Um, must go back and do it again, sort of good. But And it's a brilliant but, outdoor but the, activity. And there's not much, uh, not a huge amount of areas in Ireland to actually do No, it. and that's something that Ronan laments is that we have all these mountains, natural, natural bike parks. He says in uh, this piece that there's no reason we can't host a World Cup. And you think of the benefits of tourism of bringing all these adventure bikers and adventure tourists into Ireland to take on say the Ring of Kerry for a mountain biking tour and it just seems like it's very hard to get over the line he says that apart from maybe places like Glen Cullen Adventure Park there are so few places to go and do this which is a massive shame because you think pump a bit of money in get the resources he said there's no reason why you couldn't have like say gondolas going up mountains and then just a trail all the way down it'd be a great way to see the country a great advert for Ireland and the landscape and the beauty of the place because actually when you go up and we went in a helicopter which was another terrifying well not terrifying but interesting experience during were you this. over on a jolly a junket yeah. pretty much ah yeah. sorry yeah. why didn't you when I said why why didn't you just say well I got an invite to I got an invite it. yeah I was, was it Land Rover uh, no. Okay. Red Bull were. Oh, okay. Okay. This. Sorry. So. You name dropped them earlier on. I just yeah. thought. Well, <laughs> a load of. Yeah. Now we're now we're now we're at the crux of Ballyhowra, by the way, in uh, in uh, Limerick. That's mm. what I was thinking of. So have you done it before? I did Ballyhowra before. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, and so. proper mountain biking. Ah, like mates, mountain biking. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, have to, you know, great fun. Like, I mean, you know what's par- involved. Perilous. Yeah, I have a cousin who went to Whistler last year, right. and he said, yeah, the you do skiing season into the winter and then summer is mountain biking and it's absolutely brilliant so it's a really cool sport not something I'm willing to try because I'm <laughs> terrified of that kind of stuff but they're very interesting as athletes um, it's all downhill because cross country is the one that's in the Olympics BMX uh, and Ronan is not interested in doing cross country because it takes a lot more cardio and stamina downhill is very much a kind of technique yeah, yeah and a thrill seeker sport I'm just glad we got to the bottom of the whole thing uh, Cameron to be honest with you Ronan, Ronan yeah he can take it away from me Ronan Dunn is going up in the most it's funny just even cycling itself like the, the you know and I only got in cycling during lockdown but the differences in the the cardio challenges we'll say of like the tough challenges of cycling up hills but then the the, literally the the bottle of descending like Mm -hmm. and the technical the technical descending and it's funny my mate Ronan got me into cycling but we went over and cycled in Mallorca and we we cycled people all over the world and we were crazy compared to everyone else like they were really really tender at all the bends about and that we were all You're we were all two there. months later then I had a very bad crash but like the descent the technical and the, the, the actual bottle you have to have to descend at speed is and that's just on the normal bike and that's it and the, there's a real push because unfortunately it was cancelled but uh, this was the first year that female riders would mm. be able to qualify for hardline and um, I was reading a Guardian piece with some of the more experienced guys like G. Adderton and they were saying the reason that females have struggled to get into the sport is not so much the strength but the, the strength required to balance the bike after a jump that mm. you know you are wrestling with this thing mm. after you jump and it's not the easiest thing to control because my thoughts were when it was raining oh this would make it easier because there'd be a bit more give in the track it'd slow you down a bit but they're like no you want to try because if you slip so at all, all over that's place, you yeah. you're done <laughs> So uh, somebody who's come sport. off the bike once or twice, I can I can empathise with that. Mm. Um, right, that is coming up. Uh, Cameron, thanks a million for jumping in. Johnny, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Enjoyed that all morning. And uh, I mean, if people were, hadn't their appetite whetted enough with you, you're back again on Tuesday morning. It is going to be. Ooh. I mean, Dan and I apparently. OTBM is always worth tuning in for. But Five I'm day say, weekend, especially so on Tuesday after the bank holiday with yourself and Dan. It's, this is the mad thing. I like since becoming a journalist, I'd never know when there's a bank holiday or not. It's just I work weekends. It who's makes no odds that, to me. That, who's the who's the big dog there? Sorry, what? Who's the big dog then between the two? Of you like? Oh well, well actually, that's that is a that is a good Who question. Who's the who's the biggest ego saying? If I'm going to be part of this duo, I have to host it. I well, I'm I'm, 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 I'm I don't have an ego really, but I, I, I it's me. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. That's really all, all the best. That we were looking for all the best. The performance <laughs> rankings, all the reaction from the weekend's football, camogie, and rugby, plenty more besides as well. Cameron's interview with uh, Ronan Dunn upcoming. All the best. So I'm here at the Red Bull Hardline Downhill event here in Wales and I'm with Irish rider and national champion Ronan Dunn. Ronan, thanks for talking to me today. Well, it's crack. How are you keeping? Not too bad. How are you keeping? Ah, good, yeah. Few, good few days riding anyway here. So just, I think we're called off with the rain. So right. just that's why we're chilling in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this isn't your first time at this event. So have you had the time to get to grips with this week? And has it changed at all? Or what's the crack so far? What are you? What's your take on it? Um, yeah, like we got raced last year um, and got kind of like it was pretty bit of a shock there because like obviously coming into a race with nearly 100 foot jumps is pretty pretty insane and then you're, people are like oh come back second time you should be sweet and like you're like well I don't ride 100 foot jumps for the crack so <laughs> you kind of you kind of forget that anyway so it's always a bit of a shock to the system coming back here but once you get into practice and everyone's pretty hyped and like buzzing off like the atmosphere you're, you're like ah oh, this this is sick and like it's just you get going on from there really so it's pretty sweet and back home um, people mightn't be aware but the national series is kind of ongoing so mm. round one was a couple of weeks ago you won the first round and round two is coming up in August and then round three or sorry Round three is in September yeah. in Wexford. So, how confident are you that you'll defend your national title this year? Um, yeah, like it's pretty pretty important to me that national title. To be honest, I just love having that sleeve, and obviously, like I, I think a lot of the boys love it as well. And I know Oshin's going to be back this year, Oshin O'Callaghan, and 
I ride with me and him have been riding a lot in the winter and so like I know how quick he is so like I love him the bits but I don't want him to win <laughs> so I can't let the Limerick man take it from me no. but no it's it's a sick it's cool that like we're like so competitive but also like it's great having crack like and plus it's just nice to have that title for the World Cups really yeah you get that sense when you're in a place like this that there's a good camaraderie among the mm. racers it's you know you're in competition with each other but when you're off the track there's a bit more um, f- like friendship and mm. fellowship yeah definitely because like mountain biking you're you're racing the clock really you're like it's time trial really you're not side by side so there's no reason to be any like beef or anything or having like scraps really because like you can't you've no say in each other's race so it's pretty but it's it is so sick like this especially this event as well because it's just getting through the week with the boys and like everyone's riding together like <clears throat> following each other in for like jumps and stuff just to because it's so dangerous really. you just have to like help off each other but then once it's still racing at the end of the day as well so mm. yeah um this is a downhill event and then there's enduro and cross country can you maybe explain in lay terms what the difference between those are because i'm pretty sure some people might know yeah so enduro it's like six stages six tracks throughout the day and then you'll go get an overall time of those six tracks and the and the bikes are slightly smaller travel because i have to pedal up well uphill okay and then that will mean since the bikes are smaller travel it means the tracks are less fast rough there's less big jumps they'll be tighter while downhill bikes they have two the bikes are only made for just going downhill so then you'll see like 90 foot jumps massive drops like 70 kilometer an hour sections or something like because it's a way faster sport so the downhill is definitely a bit more on the extreme end but enduro it's also like you're so fatigued in some bits and an xc on their hand it's like side by side racing um, around a loop and like that's not very high speed but it's just extremely physical because they're like pedaling uphill like all and they're like their time throughout the whole thing so XC is definitely like super gnarly on that like um, fitness sense like I would never do it like, okay. you couldn't pay me to fucking <laughs> to do that but um, <laughs> but then downhill is all skill 100% skill based and just like turning off your mind and just going a bit crazy with it pretty much but yeah that's kind of great stuff yeah. um, looking outside conditions are fairly wet it's mm. uh, the traditional weather for this time of year yeah. this part of the world do you prefer these conditions for a downhill race or would you have preferred a dry weekend yeah like well for hardline dry weekend 100% because just with the wind it's like even yesterday it was a bit breezy on and off and hitting there's like the two 90 foot jumps and they're super exposed and hitting those with any bit of wind is like so dangerous like you could be hit the jump perfect in the air and you get a gush and the bike just goes like goes underneath you and if you crash at that you're you're pretty much done really right so like and the last thing you want is a factor that you can't control making you crash the rain on the other hand not it's not because rain's not going to blow you away so you definitely get through it on the rain it'd be pretty sketchy like it, it's going to be really hard but it's the wind is just a problem but like yeah this race i just love it to be dry because it's just you don't you don't want any more factors playing into that part really yeah, you want to keep it as simple and as straightforward yeah, as simple. possible um, what got you into mountain biking in the first place um i think you're the first irish mountain biker i've come across so far mm. so how did how did you get into this sport um yeah it's kind of like i've always like just been in like i, I live on a farm and um, so like we've just always been like had little bike pedal bikes around and just making jumps in the farm and just digging like literally just for the crack like as a kid just always had bike there so like i was always into bikes and then i used to do tr- motor trials okay. for like four years okay and i was big into that like um and that's because like we have a woods as well so it's perfect for messing around but then it was just motorbikes they're like the engines constantly breaking and it's just so annoying that and then my mate ollie davy who owns the bike park in dublin actually okay um he brought me out for the crack when i was like i think we were like maybe 12 maybe younger i think and he had a mountain bike and I, that like was the first time i ever properly rode a bike and i stopped a bit and my neighbor matt jarvis he brought us out biking as kids and then that kind of got us properly into it and then just bought a bike and then eventually 
eventually just got into the Irish racing and I was like, this is sick. And then just kind of tipping away from there really until we got to the World Cups and then here we are. And the lengths you've gone to to pursue your passion at home are crazy. I was reading, you built a 45 foot <laughs> jump in your backyard. Yeah. Um, like if I was a parent, I'd be freaking out seeing that. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, um, yeah, I, I just built that because we had a digger for the day. I think my dad was building our the, the gallops on the farm for the horses. And I was like, oh, can I have a shot of that for just a day? And I went down the woods, didn't tell the parents. Yeah, and yeah, just, yeah. just started digging anyway. And then I think after the jump, was I, like, I didn't tell them when I was going to hit it as well mm. until I just showed them videos like, oh, look, look what I did. Mm. And uh, yeah, my, like my parents are super chill with that. Like they like they're like, oh, look after yourself. But I think they'd rather me doing crashing on a 40 foot jump than out partying every week or yeah. fucking sh- throwing my life away with that stuff so I think I'm dangerous stuff but you're doing it safely as well I think you did the right thing it's easier to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission yeah. so yeah I think you got it right there yeah I've definitely done that a few times <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the level of danger in the sport um, I was talking to a few other writers mm. earlier um, is that something that you enjoy that there's an adrenaline kick off it is it something you're aware of and afraid of how how do you how do you deal with that yeah like definitely the sport's pretty dangerous like we've all had big big crashes and all injuries so like yeah definitely dangerous but i mean everything's dangerous as well so like you could be walking down the stairs and then you could slip like it's i mean i'd rather injure myself on something i'd love than like I don't know I think it's definitely worth the risk as well but just the rewards out of it let alone is just insane like just a like just the feeling you get during a race run and the crowd's going crazy or just like here hitting those jumps like it's just yeah it's it's definitely worth it there and you've gotten off relatively lightly in terms of injuries mm. so far is there anything yeah, particularly bad that's happened touch, touch yeah, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, ooh, yeah, yeah. We before the event yeah. don't forget um, but yeah you, you you haven't had any serious crashes really yeah like I've had big crashes but I've been yeah injury wise I've never broken a bone um, I'd like to say that's just a Wicklow Wicklow genes in me just yeah. fighting fighting through yeah, anything right. but or just drinking my pint of milk a day <laughs> but yeah like um, I've definitely been lucky with that as well but then also like I spent um, all winter training as well for injury prevention as well okay. like I know that's not going to help with bones or some stuff but like I mean I've put I've trained as hard as I could just so we don't get injuries as well but yeah it's 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 a roll of the dice really to be honest I just hope them Wicklow jeans keep fighting fighting true for the season and keep me grand so but uh, nah I'm happy with that anyway <laughs> What kind of training are you doing off the bike? What do you have to work on in terms of like fitness or your body and stuff like that? Yeah, so with like downhill, people are like, oh, it's downhill, you don't really have to do much. But obviously like, cause like upper body strength, just like actual general gym training a lot. So we'd um, pretty much for the winter, it'd be like in the gym four times a week or so. So that'd be actual like gym based work, just weights and stuff. And then for you, like every day you'd ride a bike for fitness wise and just, um, general general like cardio and then like we'd have like intervals on like like the rowing machines and ski like um, ski machine and stuff so like that's kind of but yeah just most of it's just building up a bit of muscle just so when you hit a tree at fuck 50k an hour you're not gonna fold in two really mm-hmm. or like when you like take a big impact you can hold yourself up so yeah and, but also you get like strength wise off riding the bike itself but it's always nice to have a little something there to keep you alive I was listening to a few podcasts um, and Bernard Kerr who is team manager for for Pivot Mm. was explaining just how expensive it is to run a team that you need like to have a good team upwards of 400 grand for you yourself is it it expensive to be racing and pursuing this Um, yeah so my first year elite it was definitely so with our team we didn't have any sponsor the team just started so we didn't have any sponsors or anything so we just all split the cost and it was definitely it's an extremely pricey sport really so that's why I was like um, I was like my family was spending so much money so I was like I had to make this work yes. or go to go to school go to college because if you're not making a living so I'm, I'm grateful in a position now that like the results are going the way it is that I can make a living off it um, but yeah like I was just like if we're spending the money just need to make sure 
make sure that I give it my 100% and I can actually make something out of this. But it is a pretty pricey sport. But if you're, yeah, if you just keep pursuing it, it can pay off, really. And you get to travel the world. There are some great places on the mm. tour between Whistler, um, I think, was it Innsbruck a couple yeah. of weeks ago. Where's your favourite place to be riding at this point? Um, where would it be? Um, definitely, I think, Morzine in France is definitely a cool spot, or Schladming in um, Austria. But, like, yeah, you see some incredible spots. Like, we're over in West Virginia last year and like it's pretty pretty cool where riding a bike can take you and um, like you're pretty grateful for that but also riding at home to be honest in Wicklow is also one of I like can't beat that there as well mm. but yeah it's, it's pretty sick just the places you get to see as well what's the mountain biking scene like in Ireland as a general rule mm, yeah like it's definitely growing the like even lads abroad will see the videos from our races and see the crowds and like well that, that looks like a world cup really and mm-hmm. um, um, yeah, the scene is definitely growing and there's some insane talent coming up from like Callum Morris or Dara Ryan. Like these are just young lads from from Ireland and they're just like, it's so sick to see the amount of talent coming up. It's just a shame that we don't have bike parks. We, we have the one bike park, but like those guys have done a great job with the hill they're given as well. But like we have mountains that could have a World Cup and like in Wicklow and like beside Dublin, we could literally have a probably one of the biggest races ever but like I think the whole Irish with their insurance it's just like yeah, yeah. I'd so and just seeing anything go besides the old GA or if I, rugby it's like it's pretty unheard of which mm-hmm. like and like we could definitely do it because I've seen the government spend money on a lot worse things and, yeah. but it, it's just a shame because it could be way bigger but for like what we're given with the hills the Irish are definitely making it work which like a lot of other countries have massive bike parks with gondolas and huge hills and like they're like they've insane riders but like just what we're what we're given we're doing a good job with it I'd say in terms of your long term goals I know this might sound like an ignorant question mm. but BMXing is at the Olympics yeah. Um, for 2024 and further foreseeable is that something you'd be interested in would you like to maybe have a shot in an Olympics at some point yeah like Olympics like I think when you say Olympics it's a pretty big it's an insane deal um, but yeah like the way downhill is it's it's weird I don't know how they'd run it with the Olympics to be honest because I don't know how the whole I don't really know why it's not in it, but also, like, I can see, like, the organization, like, you'd probably have a downhill race that could be 700 miles away from Olympic Village because it has to be in a mountain with a gondola and, like, all the right venues, so it's pretty crazy, but nah, downhill's just the only thing I'll probably be keeping the mind to, and I don't think I'd be able to take much more, (laughs) but, yeah, it'd be pretty sick to see it become Olympic sport. I think they were saying maybe have downhill in the snow and ski pieces and have it as a winter Olympic, but I rode in the snow a few weeks, or a few, yeah, like a week ago, and I don't think I'll be going back to that, to be honest. Okay, fair enough. Um, And then your season objectives for the year, what would constitute a successful season for Run On Done? Um, Yeah, so so far the season's going it's pretty consistent with top 10 so I'm saying 13th on the overall which I'm like if you said this last year I'd be like oh my god this is insane but right now it's just get that podium back like I got a podium last year and just that feeling that I had from that podium I was like I need I need to get that back and then in Leo Gang I was 0.4 of a second off uh, podium I was like yeah that's the only only objective really is just to get that back really so um, still five more rounds to go so just yeah keep the mind to it and hopefully hopefully we get there again well fingers crossed for the rest of the season hopefully you have a good weekend here in Wales and I'm sure we will hear more about you in the future Run on done thank you for joining me cheers boss thanks OCB AM The Sports Breakfast Show from Off The Ball